just like that, we're live. Hey, it's another episode of Code Corner Ooh. with Amster and the Brit. The Brit. And it's Rex Manning Day. I'm just kidding. It's C Sharp Day. Uh, Steve, you probably don't get Rex Manning Day. No, I, uh, that that one went way over my head, <laughs> as, as do most of the cultural references that you use. It's an Empire Records, that, that movie that came out probably two decades ago. So very relevant okay. reference to today. All right. uh, anyway, <laughs> it's C-Sharp Day. It is. I, it I is. know you're excited about it. Maybe the I audience am. is too. Yeah. Um, Hello, everyone. Wow. Look at all these comments woo. streaming in. This is awesome. Wow. Hey, hey, hey. Steve and I run this show called Code Corner, and we're here teaching you all about how to get started coding. And if you are not a beginner, we've also got a segment for you mm -hmm. later in the show where we look in depth at a coding project. And today, Steve is graced us by taking the back masking project that I worked on last time. I was going to say it. last week, but wow, <laughs> fixing it. Uh, not just fixing it, but uh, putting it into uh, what? Are you going to argue a better language too next, Steve? Are you oh, going to say I, that on the public internet right I now? I am biased, so yes. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Whew. Uh, we're we're going to get some... Uh, some some comments there maybe anyway so if you didn't see us last time uh we started the show off by going over python we we mm -hmm. did some variable work in python we talked a little bit about functions and uh we messed around in the command line got into the repl things like that and then we went and looked at the serverless application i built for uh back masking which is an audio engineering technique where you take audio and reverse it that it's just you have to have a special uh you can't just call it reversed audio you have to call it back it has to be, have some strange name right back, yeah but yeah and I, really back masking into the origins of that term but anyway i think it's it's more describing uh when you add that reversed audio into a song right kind of hiding uh, hiding the message in the song mm -hmm. that's right that's right so uh that's what we did last time if you're here for the first time, which probably many of you are, we're here to answer your questions all about coding. Mm -hmm. If you're just getting started coding, we've got, like I said, that beginner's corner to talk about the fundamentals of coding. And we've got project corner to work with some of the people that have been coding for a bit longer. What do you think, Steve? What, what, what should people expect watching the show? Uh, well, hopefully a lot of fun. As well, we, as you try and educate me with your various cultural references, <laughs> is the fun mandatory, Steve? Do we have to have fun? You have to have fun. Yes, okay. yes. All the right. coding will continue until morale improves. Um, <laughs> so, how to fix a memory leak for an app in C sharp? Well, it's a it's a managed environment. No, <laughs> I'm looking at the comments coming in. Yeah, I see. But we should probably also say, you know, we start the show with some general chit chat. Like, what have we been up to recently? Like, what have you been up to recently, Am? Apart from making my life heck. <laughs> I mean, that's my primary purpose in life. Uh, so if you're going to remove that, I haven't been up to much. No, uh, only joking, of course. Yeah, I've been working a lot in uh, TypeScript, actually. I'm finishing up um, a... So I work... We didn't do proper introductions of our job titles or we, anything like we that. We did not. We did not. Maybe we should do that first, and that might help educate people on what it is you've actually been doing. Yeah, that's true. So I'm I'm the developer advocate for um, a fun program at AWS called Game Day. Um, AWS Game Day, to be specific. Uh, Game Day is a big uh, hands-on type of of I'd say gamified workshop, but workshop is not even a great way to describe it because workshops are very linear, very mm -hmm. uh, you know step by step. This is completely, it's like an escape room almost, honestly. If you've ever done an escape room, it's would, kind of like. Would choose your own adventure kind of be like that? I mean, there's, there's, yeah. you know, there are certain guardrails, obviously, right? But you within those guardrails, you are navigating a path, right? Yes, yes. Uh, a bit, a bit. It's, it's, it's kind of, I, I always use escape room as, a, it's like an escape room in an AWS account. Anyway, we've got a bunch of tools for building these things. Um, and I've been working on the TypeScript SDK. So TypeScript, Steve, mm -hmm. should, I, should I talk a little bit about what that is in case? Sure. 
anybody we okay. we have a bunch of people new to coding on here so yeah yeah i see i see we've got a uh, i've got uh i'm a beginner in coding uh mm -hmm. starting an welcome. aws journey keen to learn more uh welcome everybody yeah. uh we also had a question about back masking too it's not <laughs> It's not for the acoustic echo cancellation. It's actually just taking a piece of audio and reversing it. Um, for we'll fun. get to see it later, right? Um, yeah. Or to hide messages, right? Um, anyway, so uh, TypeScript, it is a typed version of JavaScript, right? So it, it's taking mm -hmm. all of what JavaScript can do and then adding strong types to that. And uh, it's, it's becoming... Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people's preference for working with JavaScript because some of the some of the reasons that we saw in Python uh, last time, right? Uh, anything. Yeah, I mean, you and I be... both both worked in TypeScript, right? When we were working on some of the tooling at, at AWS, right? And I yeah. found it an easy thing to adopt because I was coming from a C sharp background, which mm -hmm. is strongly typed, into JavaScript, which is not, and that was a bit of a hurdle for me. But TypeScript got me over that hurdle. Right, this, Steve. I knew this would. Yeah, PowerShell is more of a dynamic type system, um, as we'll see in in a, well, a little while. Um, yes. But yeah, you've got some some power uh, PowerShell today, don't you? We're going to have a few snippets of PowerShell, yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so TypeScript uh, it just offers it offers a couple of things, but the primary purpose of TypeScript is to add in strongly typed uh, types to the language, so that you can't reassign a variable to, you know, from a string to a number, for example. Um, so we saw some of that in Python mm -hmm. last week with the REPL, right? Where I can yep. change uh, a declared variable to a different type without Python yep. complaining about it. Um, right. There are actually type annotations uh, in Python now too. There's been a lot of work uh, recently in the past few years adding in type annotations. So you can do similar things to what you do with TypeScript mm -hmm. in Python as well. Yeah, I actually enjoyed the time working in TypeScript. That was a that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's what I've been up to a lot. Um, what about you, Steve? What have you been up to? Well, I've been out mostly at events. Um, obviously, events are beginning to kick off again. Um, so I spent uh, a week down in California a couple of weeks back where we had developer week. Okay. Um, which is a, a very broad spectrum developer conference. It's not .NET specific. It's not Java specific. It's just a whole bunch of, of, of devs um, working at a, an expo booth and, and delivering sessions. That was that was a lot of fun. And in fact, it, it what made it even more fun was in the last episode, right, when we were talking about languages. Yeah. And we had a lot of questions about what language should I learn, right? And we had a bit of a, a back and forth discussion about, well, from, from my recommendation, you should learn two. One is a scripting language like Python or whatever you, you feel like, Bash, I don't mind. The other one would be a strongly typed language like C Sharp or Java or maybe use TypeScript, e either way, but something that has typing in it, right? Right. And the exact same question came up at the booth. So on the first day of the conference, um, in the evening time, we had a whole bunch of students came in, which is just awesome. I spent a whole lot of time talking to this you know, three, four, five students um, that, that stopped by the booth asking about modern development, cloud development. What language should I use? Um, what's it like working in the IT industry? Um, you know, I, I don't know why they came to the Silverhead guy to ask about that particular question. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> they can't see my hair, so they don't you know. know what it was it was a lot of fun, and we we had the exact same discussion about you know what? Don't focus on one language to the exclusion of all others. You know. Take pick a pick a dynamic language, pick a, a strongly typed language, uh, and then learn those, and then see which one, see which side of the fence you prefer. Um, maybe you like both. I I'm happy happy working in both, uh, and then go from there. So, but yeah, it was fun. So, and there's also been um, some other news that's come out in the .NET land. So we didn't not introduce me. Um, yeah, we did. So I'm going to introduce myself now. So I'm Steve. So. I'm a developer advocate at AWS, but I focus on the .NET and PowerShell tech stack. Um, so that's why we're doing .NET today, because it's my turn. Um, so yeah, it's there's been a, a so there's been some news out there. Um, so if you want to bring up my screen, uh, we got a we got a new release this week. <laughs> Wait a minute, <laughs> are we doing C sharp? <laughs> ah, well, see, this is the interesting. Uh, it, it's both. So A Steve loves it, um, but also um, there are language benefits. 
right? And performance benefits. It, it, it depends on what the, the answer to that question is. It depends, right? If that's I'm the classic answer to it's every the classic question. answer, right? It depends on what you're trying to achieve, right? Um, I've always worked in a C sharp, C plus plus, C kind of language domain. Um, so Python to me is new. So I'm learning Python part of this. Yeah. Or, or, or trying to ignore Python as part of this. I don't know which way I'm going to put it, but anyway, I'm learning something. Um, it, it, it depends. Um, but the thing is, in Code Core now, we're trying to be language agnostic, right? So, yes, I'm going to use C Sharp or PowerShell. Um, AM is probably going to use Python or TypeScript. Um, maybe I'll convince it to use Java at some point. I don't I don't know. I'm... I'd probably be more likely to do some Go before Java. Well, Go, right? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's a learning journey, right? We recognize that everybody is at different different parts of that journey, right? We've been coding for, oh, I don't know how many years, decades now, right? Um, we've got people on the show who are just beginning, right? Right. Um, which is where the what language should I start with, um, et cetera, discussion came from last time around. Um so we're trying to cover as many bases as we can. Obviously, we don't know every language out there. Uh, if I could find myself a COBOL compiler, I'd share some COBOL. But anyway, that's beside the point. <laughs> that's where I started. Um, but yeah, so back to the, back to news um, before, we, before we move on. So yeah, we've had some new releases in the .NET land um, that I wanted to, to highlight. Um, sure, yeah. You can bring up my screen. You got it. So the first one is this. Uh, this came out this week. This is literally hot off the presses. Um, so this is a new set of libraries, extension libraries, if you're coding Lambda functions, which we're going to be doing later on uh, in C Sharp using .NET. Um, and basically what this is, uh, it takes away, um, I was going to say some of the grunge work, but it's not really grunge. It's, it, it's basically attributing code, and we're going to see this later on. Um, but there are three libraries, one for logging, one for metrics, one for tracing. And... What you do is you basically can add the relevant package to your Lambda function project. You can set some variables, and then you can annotate your code. So you see this statement that says logging, right? That's going to inject logging support, calls to logging in CloudWatch, in CloudWatch logs from the Lambda function. So it's going to intercept all the logging output, send it to CloudWatch logs, but in a structured format. So I'm going to show you that one later on. Um, so that came yeah. out literally this week. So this is the kind of example of a log you're going to get, a structured log. And when you get a structured log, what that means is then you can execute queries against those logs and use like a SQL type language. Nice. Mm -hmm. So really, really useful for ops. Um, there's also a bunch of uh, metrics and other things in, inside this library. So I wanted to highlight that one to start with because we're going to be taking a very quick look at that later on um, when I take your backmass function. I've already written it in C Sharp, but I'm going to extend it to use our new annotations framework for Lambda. And I'm going to use the power tools as well. I uh, love it to show how it removes a lot of the boilerplate code. We're getting we're getting still some comments about language too about language yeah. choice. Um, and and I wanted to highlight this as there are lots of reasons to use languages, right? Yeah. Uh, every language has strengths. Every language has weak weaknesses. Uh, I wanted like mm -hmm. JavaScript, for example, uh, got a strength in your front end is going to use JavaScript right. and your back end application. So like the website. Uh, view that people see when that's what we refer to when we say front end, and then the back end is maybe a server, maybe a Lambda function, maybe you know, uh, API gateway fronting something else, right? right. Uh, so but you can do the same thing in C Sharp, you can, right. but called, I think we have a thing called Blazor, right? Blazor, oh, true, runs on yeah. the server, right? right? And, and renders pages on uh, from the server side, but you can also use it on the client side instead of using JavaScript, right? You can actually write your code in C Sharp on the front end. Very, if you very wanted to, right? Point. If you wanted to stay in one particular language stack, maybe that's attractive. Maybe it's not. It, it depends True. again on what's your use case. What do you need it to do? True. Right. I, I saw another mention of uh, cybersecurity and Python, which again, this mm -hmm. is this is Python's very prevalent in the cybersecurity world. There's a lot of the tooling uh, and a yep. lot of the, the servers, uh, you know, already have Python installed that you're working with, like Linux servers in the cybersecurity world, typically. Uh, machine learning, also another big place where Python uh, mm -hmm. kind of rules. Well, that's where we got we got started on trying to teach me Python, right? Because we've yeah. done a whole load of AWS on air segments at various events where there's been a lot of machine learning. Yeah. Right? And <laughs> I'm out of my depth. I can read it, but I don't really understand it. Thank you, Carlos. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd put that up there for you. And today, that's the language we're talking about. Is we C will be. Right? Um, 
Yep. So there's a couple of other things I wanted to um, to bring to people's attention from .NET land. Since it's kind of like my week, is server-side rendering possible? Yes. Um, server-side rendering is possible. Um, so my colleagues, so if you're working with Lambda functions in .NET, C Sharp. Uh, which we my will be today. Brian, which we'll be doing today. He's got a blog, No Dogma blog. Um, we got a link to throw up on screen. Oh, um, yeah, so he posts good. quite frequently about Lambda uh, and C Sharp. Um, so if you're into that, go check out this blog um, site. The other one that I wanted to bring to your attention, uh, I don't have a page for this, is we have a new .NET on AWS show on Twitch. So it's streaming. I think the next episode is next week. Um, yeah, March 10th. Um, that will be on Twitch. Uh, my colleague Isaac presents that. He has special guests on last week in the – come on, come on, come on, AM, keep up. <laughs> well, you still got the blog post up. So. Well, I don't, have a, I don't have a page for the, uh, the, no the Donut Show for the right now. Show. Okay. But he has – so, so last week's inaugural episode, he had on my ex-colleague Norm, who I worked with on the SDK and .NET tooling at AWS, and they were talking about the annotations framework that we're going to be showing today. Well, they were showing it from the perspective of let's write a brand new Lambda function using it. Whereas what we're going to do today is take the existing project and then move it to the annotations framework and show how easy that is. Okay? There's your .NET show. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, the .NET show. We, um, had a, uh, we had a comment come in. I, yes, I, I did say machine uh, Python is very popular in machine learning. That's right. Yes, yeah. machine learning is a concept, but a lot of people utilize Python when working with machine learning because Python has a lot of bindings to uh, C libraries, and mm -hmm. uh, those C libraries are are helping you achieve machine learning uh, through the frameworks like things like PyTorch, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Curus, et cetera, right? So Python is a very, very popular language for machine yeah. learning practitioners. Uh, There's also yes. ML.NET. I was going to say, library, right? I've never used it, so I right. don't know how how it compares to say using Python. Obviously, Python is probably more popular. I would I would say, um, but it is there. So, right. Either way, you can't go wrong with either language, in my opinion. But you know. did you remove your uh, your screen? Yes, I just took my okay. screen off. That was the one bit of control I had. <laughs> okay, I was I was uh, I was wondering if that just happened. Uh, Anyway, I wondered why I could hear cogs grinding from this distance. <laughs> I was like, wait, wh where'd the screen go? Uh, Python is not the only language. No, it we're is not. Learning. As no. Dave, or as um, Steve just said, um, there, there's ML. Actually, um, is it uh, Sharma says, can we do ML in C Sharp? Yes, you can. There's a library called ML.net. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. There we go. You can use to do that. Um, Where are you? ML.net. Here it is. Actually, I'll bring it up. We got it. Yeah. Got there you. we go. ML.net. There you go. So you can do it in C Sharp. I've never done it. Maybe that's sort of a future project that we could do on Code Corner. Um, but yeah, it is possible. All okay. Right. Cool. So that takes us to uh, what? Beginner's Corner? I think yeah. it's Beginner's Corner time. All right. So let me uh, throw up. Beginner's Corner! That's what we've got for graphics this time round. <laughs> this is a low-budget show. <laughs> Me, I'm the graphic. Uh, all right, so Beginner's Corner. What is Beginner's Corner, Steve? What are we going to be doing today? Um, well, beginner's Corner is, is literally that. If you are at the beginning of learning to code using either scripting languages or statically typed languages like we're going to be showing today, um, we are starting from almost pretty much ground zero. Um, we're not assuming any knowledge. So last time out, we started a discussion on variables because obviously when our code runs, we need somewhere to store values, right? We've either called something and we need to store that value um, or we were using a temporary value in, in some code that we're running to do a, a computation, or whatever, but we need somewhere to store it, right. right? So we went through showing how in Python, you know, we work with variables, how we can assign numbers, strings, how we work with them in code, et cetera. Um, so today we're going to be taking a look at the C-sharp way of doing it um, and what the difference is between strongly typed and dynamically typed languages. All right. Very nice. Uh, we're getting some some questions in from chat. Um, can I use Python libraries in C-sharp? I think there's a, there is a, 
It's called Iron Pi, I believe, that can run Python code. There, yeah, many years ago, there was a there was something called Iron Python. Yeah, um, Iron that I think Python. Microsoft created, but I don't know what happened to it. Um, still, it's. I just googled it. It's still here. Still around. Okay. Yeah. I mean, being .NET is a multi-language runtime, right? There's C Sharp, F Sharp, VB .NET. Um, so there's also COBOL .NET um, for those so inclined. Um, but I didn't know what happened to Iron Python. Yes. Yeah. I, so, I mean, I think uh, I think some people are, are questioning why you're showing them C Sharp today, Steve. So uh, I didn't get this when we did Python. Uh, it's very interesting. But I'm, yeah. sure, I'm sure you hear this all the time, especially as a dev advocate at AWS mm -hmm. for C Sharp, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And .NET, you know, why? Why C sharp? I'll ask what everybody. I'll summarize. Why, why C sharp? In chat. Why? Why should you I care my, about C sharp? You want my personal opinion? <laughs> I want both your personal opinion and also like more practically. Why is it a language that I should invest some time in? So C sharp differs from my knowledge of Python right now, right? In that, um, for, well, from a personal opinion, C sharp is a very elegant language. Right? It's into version. 10, I think, right now. You've got some, um, you've got some support in chat. I've got some support here, right? Um, it's actually a very elegant language. In fact, if you look at the Stack Overflow sort of language rankings uh, that, that come out every year, it's, it's pretty highly rated. Um, it's a very nice language to code in. Has a lot of, it has some really nice syntactic sugar that it has that avoids some of the boilerplate that you get with other languages. Yeah. But it's also a very, very performant language when it's compiled. Um, no, I don't want to steer too much in towards Lambda and, and cold stars because dynamic languages like JavaScript, Python are always going to launch faster in that environment than a, than a compiled language that has to load a runtime, right? But once you've got over that, that launch, C Sharp is actually one of the fastest of the Lambda runtimes when it, right. it, it, it absolutely blazes through it. So um, from my perspective, I, I came from, and I think we, we touched on this in the last episode, right? I started my coding career way back in college with basic then pascal um cobol then into c then my first few years as a developer i worked in cobol um, writing cobol developer tools in cobol on yeah. on ibm pcs at the time right then moved into c c plus uh, plus c sharp etc so i've gone down that that path that ultimately led to c sharp um i haven't strayed too far from that in all honesty i've done a little bit of assembler um I still like assembler. I just don't get to code in it these days. There's something about the mindset of it. Um, but I, I think C sharp as a, as a language is a good one to learn yeah. from, from the strongly typed, you know, I want to work in an object oriented class type object or uh, I said already, you know, environment C sharp is one of the best is if not the best, I have not checked out things like rust or go, I don't know what they're like. Um, maybe I should. Um, very different. Very different. I, I'm guessing so, right? Yes. Um, but yeah, I think just because a language is compiled isn't in, in this day and age isn't a reason to say oh, I'm not, I'm not going to use that, right? Um, it's true. There are there are benefits to it, right? So we covered on last time round how you were able to just randomly assign a string to a variable that held a number, right? right. In some languages, that's an error. It is at right? at. at, at uh compile time and not runtime right? right so i'm going to catch that error at compile time right not yeah. runtime i don't want to deploy my code and then find i've got type errors uh, at right. runtime right um ideally that's my personal preference right some people are just like yeah it's fine just and there are ways to duck and it quacks like a duck then it's probably a duck right yeah there's, there are places for that kind of thing right and there are ways to achieve that with uh more dynamic typed language like python and, and javascript right. right you've got typescript that you've we got talked TypeScript, about earlier yeah. And Python has type annotations too that you can, but they're not they're not strictly enforced by the language like in C sharp or Java um, yeah. or other typed languages. You know, I'm gonna put this to chat too. If there's a language that we're not covering yet, tell us. We'd love mm. to cover it. We're look. My favorite language. This is what I say all the time, Steve. You, you get to hear it again. You know what my favorite language is, right? The one you get paid for working in. The one that they pay me to write in. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there are philosophically, theoretically, all types of languages that I prefer over one another. But really practically for me, mm -hmm. I write software 
to make a living, right? So I want to use something that is going to help me do that, right? So uh, if, if I'm more likely to get a job writing Python, I'm going to go for it, right? Uh, whatever, right? It just mm -hmm. depends on what your goals are when you pick right. what language to focus on. But if you are just getting started, like Steve said, it's not a bad path to choose to pick a scripting language and a or more, a dynamically typed language. Yeah, it's strongly typically a scripting language. Right. Yes. Accepted, right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and then also like a more object oriented, uh, strongly typed language like a C sharp yeah. or a Java, something like that. Um, yeah, we haven't. I see a lot of PHP coming in. We haven't even talked about PHP again. If you want us to cover, <laughs> I, I see Erlang. I guess people are putting in the comments now what uh, what languages they want to see. So yeah, we'll definitely. Uh, We'll definitely pepper in different languages as we. There's develop. an interesting comment from Joey. Um, just popped in. Does JavaScript have a place with AWS? Yes, it does, because you can write Lambda functions in JavaScript, or Node, um, right? Right. Um, you can call AWS services from JavaScript, right? We have an SDK for it. Yeah. Right? We have an SDK for most languages, right? So yes, it does have a place. It's yeah. not just for writing scripts on a web page. So I'm getting nervous because we're getting a lot of rust and, and rust is, uh, <laughs> maybe we need to learn rust. I don't it's know. It's a little challenging for sure. <laughs> but uh, look, I'm up for the challenge. If we want to do some rust, we can do some rust for sure. All right. Shall we look at some code? Yeah. Let's get into code. For All sure. right. So beginner's corner. I'm going to put that up again. again? All uh, right. Just because so we, we went off on a tangent there. Getting, uh, some of the questions in chat answered, though. Again, keep those coming. Yeah, like, come in. interrupt us. You know, we we're not on any type of uh, deadline here. We, we want to talk with you all. Yeah. All right. So, last time out, we were looking at Python, and you were using a REPL, right? You yeah. used Python at the command line, right? And I think I made a comment about, oh, I've never seen one for C sharp. I've seen one in Visual Studio, which is the you know the most popular ID for for .NET development. Right. But I've never seen one out in the wild. Well, it turns out there is such a thing. Oh, um, wow. hey, Steve, can you can you uh, make your uh, terminal a little bit bigger? Yes, I can do that. Uh, I've got my profiles here. See, shall I thought I'd already made it larger, but maybe I closed it by accident. It happens. It does. It definitely does. Is that better? 24? Will that maybe work for you? Maybe one more. Sorry. You already uh, oh. I think you can do command plus on the terminal. Uh, can I? Like yeah, sometimes if you do that, though, it doesn't wrap very well. Yeah, you're starts. right doing stuff so let's let's do it properly let's go for 25 how about that okay sounds good you good with that doesn't, doesn't cost you anything to go to 25 no it doesn't cost me anything it's a freebie all right there we go all my consoles should be up at 25 now all right so but what i found was there are in fact repls out there for c sharp now if you're not familiar with a repl yeah what's a repl a read evaluate print loop type environment so you can type in commands and then have them evaluated the result printed out and then you you continue that's the looping part right so turns out what I found was, going back to this, is this thing here. Now, this is not a recommendation for this by any means. This is the first one I found. There were a couple. Um, this is called C Sharp REPL. It's on GitHub. Um, so it's a cross-platform one, which you know, ideal, because I know working on a Mac, we know that we have .NET cross-platform. Right. Um, but you can type in commands. So this is the one I'm going to use today um, in the Mi console. So let's just jump in here. And one of the first thing I want to do is, when we were working with Python last week, um, you created a variable, right? And I can't remember how the variable was, was, was set up. But the first immediate difference is, well, when you look at the two languages, right, we have, we have, in, we have numbers. We have strings, right? And numbers are ints, longs, floats. We have strings. We have types like booleans um, and other different types, right? The difference with C Sharp and, and most static compile languages is you have to declare the type when you declare the variable. Right. Whereas you were just able to just assign the variable. Right. right. So in C sharp, in fact, if I start the REPL right now. Okay, so now I'm inside a C sharp REPL. Okay. Nice. I can't just say A equal that won't work. A, I don't want that equals one. Right? Because it doesn't know what A is at this point. I have to tell it, right? So I can say int A equals one. I'm gonna put semicolons in here because it's muscle memory. Right. Try and print it out, right? So A. Is one. So I have a number. Okay. Right now, right? 
The first thing you did when we were doing the Python one was you went, oh, okay, let's go A equals test. And in Python, yeah. that works because Python has a dynamic type system, right? That's right. In C sharp, that's going to error out. You cannot implicitly convert the string to an int. Right. right? Yeah. I can cast it, right? I can actually have the compiler do, do some work for me, uh, not this particular way around because test won't evaluate as a number. But if it was the other way around, if it was a string and I wanted to put a number into it, so let me actually create a string, right? String, let's call B equals hello. Yeah, right? this, this actually comes up a, a bunch when you're taking input for example, from the command right. line, and that input is always going to come in as a string. So as a string, right? But yeah. Let's say you're trying to get a number. Like, how many, uh, you know, times would you like me to iterate through this thing? You know, right. the, the input from the user is going to come in as a string, no matter what you right. do. Right. So I can't do that, right? Oh yeah, because B is now a string, right? Or B was always a string. Let's try uh, this. See if it'll see if it'll convert this. Sometimes it will. Kind of like that, right? So what I'd have to do is parse it. So I'd have to go in dot parse. Uh, should go to a string. Oh no, can't do that. Convert into a string. Getting the wrong way around. All right. You could well, do string to end. Yeah, I, you could I, do, I could do uh, like a a string literal, like quotes ten in quote. Yes, I could do that. that. Yes, and then do that. Yes. So yeah, I can do this. Let's try that. Ten. What was A? A was uh, B was a number, right? B yeah, B is a no. Yeah. B is so, a B is a string. You have to. Use I'm not a. very good at part naming my variables. <laughs> you gotta use A. A is your int variable. A is my int variable, right? Yeah. Right. Two string. So I can do this. Well, yes. ten in quotes is already a string. Yeah. B is already a quote. Was it? I thought yeah. A was my number. No, no, no. So now do A is equal to oh. uh, int dot parse. And then put B. Now do A. Hey, it's 10. There cool. you go. So that's how you'd have to do it in a strongly typed language. Right? And if you're doing this in TypeScript, TypeScript would also flag the fact you're trying to put a string into a number. Right? What about this, Steve? Is there is type there inference? inference? Type inference. There is. Like yes, with there is. Haunt, Indeed, right? there is. So or var. Yeah. In C Sharp, you use a, a, a keyword called var, right? So actually, I'm going to say a, a number this time around. Now I can do get type on this. Can I do get type on this? Yeah, get type. I should report that I didn't have yeah, but did the thing. A number. Well, a number is a is a is a number now anyway. It's a number. Right. Yes. So if if you know the 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 so let me let me backtrack. So type inference works when the compiler can evaluate what's on the right hand side of the assignment and predict what the actual value is going to be, is it a number, a string, et cetera, right? right? If the compiler can't evaluate that, then you have to actually explicitly put the type in, right? So what you'll see in a lot of code is things like, um, I don't have this type defined, but my extremely long, we're going to get into types and classes in a, in a second, right? My extremely long type name, A equals A, stop predicting equals new, my extremely long type name. Or at least I would if I could type, right? <laughs> you did so this to separate. yourself. Oh, right? <laughs> you did this to that's yourself. A lot of, that's a lot of typing, right? It is. If this was a class, and we'll we'll take a look at a class in a minute, that's a lot of typing, right? So a lot of people do, and I do this, is I'll use type inference and say var a, what it happens to be, equals new, my extremely long type name, right? My, yes. what it's going to be, right? Blah, 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 right? To save myself some typing. It doesn't save me a lot when I've just got an int equals something, right? Save me a character. So I don't do it there. Now, seems like a complex phrase. It's not really complex. It's just numbers, strings, booleans, and so on. Um, it's just the way I'm presenting it here in the REPL. When we move to a, an actual class in a minute, you'll you'll see the difference. Um, when, what was I about to say? Oh, yeah. Now, not everybody likes that approach of using var and type inference, right? Because sometimes what's on the right-hand side, you don't know, right? So if you're working in an editor like, uh, let's say, Vim or VI or things like that, right, where you don't have what we call IntelliSense, where the, the editor is showing you what the value on the right-hand side, the type of the value on the right-hand side is. Yes. When you're reading that code and you're calling a function or a method, is it actually called, is the proper name for it, right? which is returning a value, and you don't know what type that value is, 
right? When you use var, then you're looking at the code and you have this little cognitive overload, like, what well, am I getting a string, a number, a type? What am I getting, right? right? So in those scenarios, there are people who prefer to actually put the type name in to make it explicit what they're getting from the right-hand side of the assignment. But if you can predict it or it's clear, like your method's called return me a number, right? <laughs> then use var, right? It's, it, it's a preference thing, right? So yes, that is a long-winded way of defining a variable, right? Right, um, yeah. So again, when you have to declare the type on both sides of the equal signs, right? right. Like, which you don't in C Sharp, but right. as you saying, some people don't like that because uh, you know, it might make it a little less clear on what the variable type is and you, right. have, to, you have to read a bit more uh, sometimes. Yeah, so now I'm in PowerShell. Okay. Now PowerShell is based on .NET, right? Yeah. So in PowerShell, variables are a given a name by, let's call it var1 equals test, right? You use dollar to introduce the variable. So dollar and var1 is the variable name. Test. Okay. Ah, PowerShell is more yeah, like... PowerShell has a dynamic type system, right? Built on top of C Sharp, right? Yeah. So in fact, under the covers, C Sharp also has a dynamic type. Right, we were talking about this earlier before the show, right? We so were. You, can, you can work with dynamic types in C-sharp um, and other things, but I don't use that very often. But I figured I'd show you that, that you know, just because C-sharp is a strongly typed language and it won't let me assign a number to a string or a string to a number variable, right. I can do it in PowerShell. Okay? And uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me ask this to you, Steve. I've, I've got an answer as mm -hmm. well in case... Uh, we need to talk through it, but why do I care so deeply about types? Like what, what, you know, why does it matter uh, that I can declare a type out in, in my actual code? You know, it, it does it matter really at the end of the day, or can I switch between types in variables? Uh, you know, we, what do I get by, uh, by having you, this system? You get something called type safety, right? So, if you assign, um, we're going to move on to types in a minute in classes, but yeah. let's say that I assign, we're using a class, right? Which is like a template for an object, right? And classes have properties, they have methods, they have um, fields inside them, whatever, right? If I try and assign a value to a variable that's a, that's a type, a complex type, right? And yeah. then on that variable, I try and access a member, a property or a method, right? If that method or that property doesn't exist in the type that I assigned, I get a runtime error. That's okay. That's what I was hoping right? you'd bring up, Steve. Is right. runtime error? Now I get an error at runtime. My code blows up because I've attempted to access something that isn't in the type. Yeah. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. What is a runtime error? And what is the other types of errors uh, in comparison? Right. Well, there's all sorts of different. I know types there's a bunch, but like right? there's a whole bunch, right? But 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 it's, at the end of the day, the program crashes. Right. We, right, we got a runtime pro, uh, error and a compile time error, typically the two things that you deal with. Yes, with type, right. right. So with type safety languages, you get the error at compile time. Right. right? Meaning so before you're, your application before moves you even out deploy it, to right? uh, production, let's say. Correct, right? <laughs> Whereas with non-type safe languages, you, you don't see the error until somebody exercises that code at runtime. Now, the error that you get can be a little bit Obtuse. Ob obtuse, right? Yeah. Because you might, what, what what might happen in the language is you just get a value null assigned because that property isn't there, right? right? Now, if your code is able to handle that, like defensive coding, right? right. I assign a value from a type, from an, inst from an object to a variable, and then I try and use that value, right? If it's null, right? Yeah. The best way of handling it is I test first. If, if this is null, don't access it, right? Don't type checking, value, basically, right? right? Yeah. Like when you when you don't know a type ahead of time, uh, you can use type checking. Right, right. So you type check it or you use defensive programming on it, right? You don't just go, a, you know, try and access the member, right? Right. Um, it actually is interesting unstructured data coming in here with, with JSON as well, right? Oh, Sometimes yeah. you will serialize or deserialize JSON to an object, right, to work with it. We do that a lot in C Sharp, right? If that JSON does not have that property value, and you try and access it, it's going to go bang, right? So that's an example of runtime. You need to be defensive in that code. Um, but that's why that's what it gives you is that benefit of catching the errors 
upstream before you actually deploy the code. Right. Right. Um, sure. As opposed to trying to catch them at runtime. Now that doesn't always work in even in type languages. I just said, right. You can get a structure back, a data structure back from something that yes. doesn't contain the value you expect. Right. So you still have to code somewhat defensively, but basic errors like trying to assign a string to a number variable or the other way around that kind of thing, it, it'll catch a compile time. So it's saving you time ultimately. Yeah. Right? With, uh... What would you rather do? Would you rather catch that error when you're compiling the code? Or right. would you rather catch that error when your pager goes off in the middle of the night because you've deployed it and you didn't have a check? Right. 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 I know yeah. what I'd rather do. This does not help for when you encounter things like parsing errors, right? So when you're right. sending JSON around to various different services, right? when the service receives that JSON, if it's improperly formatted, it doesn't matter what language you're, you're, you're using, right? You're going to likely have a parsing error mm -hmm. because uh, I would say the parsing error would probably happen more uh, quickly in a language like .NET or C Sharp because you're coercing the JSON that you parse into a class Right. And so that's yeah. when it would happen. Whereas in a more dynamically typed language, when you try and access a property that isn't on the object that you get back, uh, that's that's typically when you'd see, uh, you know, uh, dynamic languages are much more forgiving with improperly yes. formatted JSON than something like C sharp. If you are coercing yes. into a real class in C sharp instead of using a dynamic object like Steve yeah. mentioned earlier. Yeah. So. What we've been doing up till now is not typically how you you would work with C sharp, right? No, C no. sharp is an object oriented language, right? It's it revolves around things like classes, structs, records, actual types that contain not just values but also what we call behavior or methods or functions, right? Right. So I figured what we would do is now let's move on and actually let, let's write a class hierarchy for something, right? Okay. Um, and show how that's done in C sharp, and then maybe the elegance of the language will start to present itself because you don't typically start to C sharp REPL and start banging out variables, right? Right. Um, so I'm classes, thinking... Steve. I classes. just like I, I love that classes allow you the way that I understood it when I first learned about them. They allow you to organize data and behaviors, mm -hmm. and usually the behaviors are related to the data that is also mm -hmm. storing mm -hmm. in the class. It's one of the easiest ways that I found to. Uh... Where is Ryder? Oh, you going for Ryder? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, I want to open that one. Yes, open that one. Yeah, I figured we'd do something different. I love it. That's great. Yeah, seeing another IDE. We used Visual Studio Code in yep. last week or last time's episode. Um, so now we got a different IDE. And IDE very quickly is just an environment where you do a lot of development work. It includes a lot of tools that you need to to, to compile code, to run code, yep. to work with Compile, code. build it, run it, debug it. Um, or you can use an editor, uh, or you can just do everything from the command line. It's it's right. your choice, right? Yeah. But this is a typical, typical um, so your hello world, hello world type of class, right? So what we have is something called a namespace, right? So this is a, a grouping mechanism, if you like, for the different types in a yeah. program, right? You can have multiple namespaces in a in a program, in a piece of code, right? So for example, if you're writing a web application and you're using MVC model view controller architectures, right? Yeah. Which we'll come to, I guess, in a future episode, right? Yeah. Well, I might have one namespace for my model classes, one for my view classes, one for my controller classes, right? Um, then I have a class, right? So a class you can think of as, the way I like to think about it when I'm explaining is, it's like a, a cookie cutter. Right, in that I'm defining in the class all the different properties, like the variables, the values that that class can hold, as well as the functions or methods that I can run inside that class, right, on that data, right? Right. And then when I stamp that cookie cutter into some dough and I actually I get a cookie, that's an object. Yeah. Right. So the class is the type, and the cookie dough is the is the object, right? Can I take a stab at a uh, description too? Yeah, um, absolutely. So for me, I, I one of the more hands-on or practical implementations of classes that really stuck for me was um, think about cards, right? There are all types of different cards out there in the world. There's 
playing cards, there's tarot cards, there's Magic the Gathering cards, Steve, uh, mm -hmm. talking about those uh, before we went live as well. All of those cards share the same characteristics, right? Like all of them have similar characteristics that, you know, they might have a number uh, right. assigned to them or a value or a rank or something like that. And so what you do is you define that we haven't even talked about inheritance yet, but I'm getting, we're getting of, together. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you just, you design a class that can encompass all of the other types of these cards that, you know, and, and you do that by defining things like, well, they have a rank or a suit, you know, uh, but not everything has a suit. So you try and think back and, you know, disassemble what you're trying mm -hmm. to achieve into the most, uh, generic set of properties and behaviors as you can when you're designing a class. And then you use that class to make, you know, uh, different types, right? Different types mm -hmm. of these things that all share this characteristic. Different instances. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, when you start using the word type. Yeah. Um, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we didn't even like, there's things called interfaces in C sharp that also can you know, work within this, uh, yeah. kind of paradigm. There's abstract classes versus concrete class. It gets a little bit more complex. Yes. But we'll start simple, right? Steve? Actually, while we're, while we're at that, um, if you're, if you are looking to learn C sharp, Oh yeah. Let me bring this up. So this is a really good guide. It's the C sharp programming guide. Um, it's on learn.microsoft.com. Um, and there's a whole bunch of tutorials um, and background information on C Sharp, et cetera, um, that you can find inside there, including the type system, how it works, um, when you can use var, so type inference versus actually explicitly having to say the variable name, anonymous types where you the compiler literally synthesizes a type name for you. Yeah. Right, which can be useful if you just program data structs. Actually, we're coming to structs in a minute. Thank you, Devin. Mm -hmm. um, records and so on um so there's a whole whole bunch of and this is one of the reasons i like c sharp because c sharp is a language that it began as a very elegant language but it's be, it's it's getting better over time They're adding more and more stuff that just saves you so much effort right um in, in terms of how things get done so records for example right again this is going to be a more advanced for beginners corner than we want to get into right now but but if i'm writing a web application and that web application is querying a, a back-end database Right. So I'm running a, let's say, a SQL query against a, a database engine. Right. Yeah. And I get back um, a dot net object. Right. That dot net object that's come back from the query may well have more data in it that I want to send to the than I want to send to the web front end. Right. So what we tend to do is we write what are called data transfer objects, DTOs. Right. And a DTO is like a cut down version of the data that came back from the back end system. So it might not have like the object key, for example, right? The item key or some other data that's in there, right? So we compress that data down into a DTO and then right. we send the DTO back to the front end and the front end renders it, right? Well, C-sharp invented something called records. And with records, with the DTO traditionally, what I have to do is I'd have to go and define a class for that DTO, hmm. right? And put in the properties that I want it to return. And then when the query comes back, I can use a tool like a mapper to actually map from the, the, the data that came back from the database into the DTO and then send that back, right? Yeah. Or I can define something called a record, which is new, where I just actually give it a record and I give it the property names and then the compiler figures out the mapping. Nice. And sends it back. I don't have to define it a full, full on class. So it's kind of kind of quite elegant. But anyway, if you want to learn C sharp, I recommend go and hit this. There's a bunch of tutorials, etc. So let's go back to Rider and we were going to build something. So a class yeah. hierarchy. What, what should we what should we put together? Can we uh, can we pause real quick and and just do a quick uh, if you're if you're just joining us? Yes, yes, please okay. do. If you're just joining us, this is Amster and the Brits Code Corner. We are discussing C sharp today. Today is C sharp day. I said it was a uh, Rex Manning day, and I lied because it's C sharp day <laughs> instead. But we cover beginning fundamentals to coding in various languages, and then we also at uh, the second half of the episode have a project for people who are further along in their coding journey. Mm -hmm. But we're here live with you all taking questions, uh, you know, looking at chat. So if you've got questions about coding, if you've got questions about C-sharp, 
today's your day. Let's let's talk Z sharp. Mm -hmm. Devin does have a question about what you were just talking about, Steve. Dictionary record. So a dictionary is a key value structure, right? So uh, the, the dictionary type has elements inside it that are addressed by keys. The record is a more formal type where the the the, the data inside it is accessed by property names. Mm. It's, it's kind of similar, but but not. A dictionary can hold more than one item. A record holds one thing. A dictionary can hold multiple things addressed by keys. So a DTO is just a compiled version of data. Does it pre-render that data from the back end? No, the rendering happens on the front end. Depending on if you're using, if you're using JavaScript and you get the DTO back, you would render right. it there. If you're using C sharp, then the rendering would come from the ASP.NET pipeline sending HTML back. So all right. So what were we gonna what were we gonna build as a class hierarchy to illustrate classes and structs and things? What what would you like to build? Huh. I mean we, we could build a card. Uh deck class, of cards. Like I was saying, you know, I was using uh tarot cards as my example, but what uh, cards? Tarot, T A R O T. Tarot? Oh, tarot. Yeah. Well, uh, I've heard of them. I'm not entirely sure what they are. Are they, they safe predict your work? future, Steve? Uh, tarot cards. Yeah. No, we, let's just do playing cards. Uh, yeah, but they have. Uh, they've got properties. They've got behaviors, right? Right. Um, right. And so we can model that in a class. Okay. Well, let's do that. So let's say we make a card type, right? Yeah. Okay. So what properties are you going to want inside here? So, a suit, right? Okay, so we're going to call it. Uh, should we make it a string? Probably a string because uh, we've got what clubs, hearts, etc. So what I'm doing now is I'm introducing what's called a property, right? So this this syntax in C sharp means there's a property on the card object called suit, and the get means that I can read it. Yeah. Right? I thought so. It's not superstition. <laughs> Look. And the set means I can set it. Now, you might be asking, what's this public thing here, right? So yeah. if I can actually take this out, actually, let me uh, let me new this thing up, right? So var card, you should have done this in REPL, I don't know, equal var c new card, right? I've created an object and I've put it in a variable called c, right? And you've noticed I've used type inference, right? I didn't say card c equals new card, right? Here I can access the property called uh, suit, right? Because it's got public access. Right. right. If I was to take that away, and let's just say I make this private by default, which is if I don't mess by any access modifier, right? This is where intelligence is really handy, right? You'll notice that suit is no longer available to me. Right. And this is another advantage of strongly typed languages, right? You can have these access modifiers. If this was JavaScript, I could access a suit property on that object, no problem, even though I, declare, I didn't want you to access it. Right. Is that yeah. making sense? Makes sense to me. Yeah. All right. So the other thing that we can do is we can say, let's make this public. Okay. So remove. now we'll be able to get. I can access it, but I can remove the setter, right? Oh. So now I can only read the data. Okay. Right. Interesting. Um, the other thing we can do is let's say uh, actually public enum. Uh, actually, we, you, what we would probably do with this is call a suit enum. Yeah. So now we can define out cards, diamonds. I don't play cards, so you have to help me out here. Suit diamonds, spades. What yep. is sappies in this particular case? Spades. What else would we use? Hearts, Clubs. Diamonds, spades. Clubs. Clubs. Thank you. I told you I don't. I don't play cards. There's a reason board games are called board games. Um, Swords, pin tag, pin tackles. Uh, no, that's not how you said that. Let's word. call this card suit, right? Just kidding. And here we'll make this the enum card suit. That's it. Okay. Yeah, chat. Chat did not like my tarot uh, suggestion, so I'm glad we went with playing cards <laughs> instead. Oh dear. All right. Now, the other thing that we can do with this is you'll notice that I can't actually, I can read the card suit, but I can't set it from anywhere, right? So back in this code here, I can't say c.cardsuit, uh, c.suit uh, rather, you know, the public get right equals um, doo -doo -doo, card suit dot clubs, right? You'll notice that that's erroring out. There's no setter. So I can't just blindly add this in, right? If I put on the set here, now I have a set and now it's now it's available, right? This is 
yeah, what this is doing is, is you ignore that green squiggle. It's a, it's a nice handy thing in C sharp where you can initialize an object inside the new statement. Um, I love this. I love this. Uh, I want. Are you getting? Are you getting tied up in your tarot cards? No, no, no. I'm a, I'm a complex thinker. Uh, I want this. <laughs> I want this comment framed. I love it. I'm going to take that setter away. All right. Now, so now we, we can't we, set the suit. We can only we can't access. set it directly outside. Once the card's been created, tough, right? We can only read it, right? Um, the other thing is, what's the what's the name given to the the number of like, three of hearts or seven of spades? Oh, then yeah, um, I think that's called uh, something like value, maybe. Um, value. Mm, I don't want to use value. Um, well, but maybe it's rank actually. Rank. Oh, okay. Rank. Because you can also have aces, queens, kings. So those are different than the suits. That's true. So hmm, you I have one through one. ten, right? Yeah, and then you have king, jack, queen, right? So how and would we king. how would we model that as a, hmm, a value? You could use a value, right? You could map eleven as a jack, twelve as a queen, thirteen as a king. Yeah, ace is one. Well, one or not always eleven. One, right? Wait, that's uh, blackjack. No, um, <laughs> I can actually, see. it is. It, it would be one in most cases because we start numbering at two on on the cards. There's not a one card in a deck of cards. We know less about cards than we do, we do about shops. Right? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Maybe we should have used musical instruments. Yeah, I don't know. yeah. But this is this is an interest. But but the thing is. This is an interesting exercise when you're when you're learning a language, right? Right. It doesn't matter what language it is, whether it's uh, dynamically. Oh, yeah, that's true. You have jokers too. Thank yeah. you, uh, Umar. Um, that's. I thought he was talking about. Way. I thought he was yeah. saying about me. Uh, um, you but were, it, it's an interesting to you, thing, thing to do, right? So you're learning a new language. It doesn't matter whether you're an experienced coder or whether you're brand new to coding, right? Yeah. Is to pick something real world, like furniture or pets or musical instruments doesn't matter what it is right but right. something that has a kind of a hierarchy to it and and different types of those things right so you have chairs tables um etc no 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 continue with cards <laughs> i'm gonna try um right look at, this, look at this from isaiah too this is why we do right. it isaiah that's why yeah. we cover so many languages glad to hear that it's right. helpful to you yeah um right so pick pick something and then try and model it in the language yeah. that you're learning, right? Yeah. That's kind of a little bit more useful, in my opinion, than just doing exercises where you're saying, okay, let's compute the value of pi to, I don't know, the nth value using this language, right? It's, who cares, frankly, right? Pick something and go model it, right? Um, yeah. And I'll give you a, a good example. I did an interview once. I was on the receiving end of the interview, and I, I passed because I'm here. Um, mm -hmm. where I had to actually model the game of Monopoly. Oh, wow. Okay. Right? Um, in classes, right? Uh, in a one-hour interview. I guess you got properties. You've got... You've got properties, right? You've got, the, you got the properties on the board, right? right. You've got um, whether they have houses on them right now or hotels, what's yes. the rent, um, so on so there's there's method inside there's there's behavior inside those properties right if a, right. If a player lands on it then you have to calculate the rent right you know the base rent you know the number of houses and hotels right so there's a whole bunch of things uh, inside there that is actually a lot of fun to do um, right okay there you go all right so where, where did we end up with the rank so you you thought there any, a, a number would be enough yeah, because we could just, uh, if it's equal to one, because yeah, look, like, let's think about it this way, right? To the, the, the back end system, it doesn't really matter how we display, mm -hmm. right? We just need to know that one equates to ace or right. 11 equates to, to jack, jack, right? right. Yeah. Um, so we just need uh, All right. some kind let's of dictionary, I'd say, to figure that out later. But, um, Oh, interesting. Pace. Okay. Okay. Right. Return. So this is actually uh, now we're moving into methods. Right. Right. 
And you'll notice that Roy just telling me that this this method this this property could be made private. That's because it doesn't know that I'm not using it outside anywhere. Right. Right. So ignore the green swiggles. Right. And we could do the same thing for. Uh, I'm not going to write all these out, but bool is the is the true false type in C sharp. Right. Right. Is is a king. I'm not saying I would necessarily write this like this all the way, but right. Um, and just to be clear to chat, this is not, these are playing cards. These yeah, are we're cards just messing around here, right? Used in like blackjack and poker and things so, like that. Right. Yeah. Um, right. So we've got that. So the public means that I can access it, right? I can call this from outside. So without that, if I'd nude up this card, without that, uh, I wouldn't be able to access that method, right? Right. Right. Yeah, because that so there are ways to uh, access methods on classes without having an instance of the class. Right. But these are instance methods. These right? are instance methods, right? Now I could also make. Uh, let me think. What would be a static method with a card? Um, oh, a static method. Yeah, is shared by all instances of class, right? Hard. Well, you don't even need an instance. No, you can call you it from right? the class itself. What if you uh, you wanted a static? Oh, deal. Okay, interesting. I was going to say a good static method might just be uh, show possible, like show a full deck. You know, rank equals I don't know rank equals uh, let's say five and uh, suit. And why won't you let me access that thing? <laughs> card suit equals card suit diamonds. Right, return the five of diamonds. All right, what does it like here in this side here? Public static property cannot be assigned to. Well, that's true, right? Because I didn't give it a setup, right? Again, type safety to the rescue, right? right? If this was a dynamic language and I just deployed this, that code would blow up at runtime, right? Which is why I like this. So let's give it a private setter. Go. Oh, that's so, so that's now we're in private accessibility, right? So any anybody can read from the class, right? But, but only the class itself can. The class itself can set, right? Okay, yeah. right. So that's what private means. There's and this also, is for inheritance, right? Like which we haven't talked well, about. Well, primarily it's for yes and yes and no, right? So okay. with inheritance, we typically use a, an access modifier called protected. Right. What protected means is. The class itself, the instance itself, or its derived classes, derived right. types from that class can access that, that member, be right. it a property, be it a method, be it a field, right? So right. everything I've done so far in here, I've accessed, I've added actual properties, right? Yeah. I can also do things inside here like create fields. So I can say right. public. You typically wouldn't do this. You can say public int, I don't know, some value, right? Right. That I can access and write things to. Typically, you access C Sharp object properties through a property declaration. You don't just write random fields in there. But you, you, well, can you can also you set right? public, private, and protected methods as well. You can have public, private, protected methods. Yeah, yeah. Right. So here now, for example, I can say var C equals instead of saying new card, I can say card dot deal. So that that deal method there, that static method, that's like a factory method. What we call right. a factory method, right? It creates an object for me, right? Yes. And it re returns a pre-initialized object of some That's form, right. right? So I have that. The other uh, thing you can do with classes in C Sharp is you can do, uh, actually, one other thing I want to do, I'm not going to use this value, but you can do things like const. We got a question from Devin. Protected Does it work? For, it works for children of children. Yes, it goes all the way down the chain. So uh, classes that are higher, higher, in the chain can't see that protected member, but the classes below it can. Right. The types below can, right? Public const inst, uh, and again, I'm just going to do constant equals ten, right? So in C sharp, and like Java and like most languages, languages, you have the con you have the concept of, of variables, of values that you can read and write, subject to access modifiers that we've been using, right? You right. can also have constants, right? Yes. So let me go back to the, the REPL for a moment. And uh, C sharp REPL. These are values that can't change. Const int A equals 10. 
right? That's an integer. It's a number, right? It is. What I can't do is that. You can't change that I value. You cannot change that constant, right? right. Now, C-sharp also has the concept of read-only. Now, you might be asking yourself, what's the difference between constant and read-only, right? I am asking myself that. Yeah. I'm glad that you asked. Right. So in C-sharp, when you have a constant, let's say I'm writing some code, right? Yeah. And I'm referencing a type that has a constant value inside it, right? When I compile the code, the output binary will actually take that value and put it into my code, right? Okay. So on my left hand here is my 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 code right. that I'm running. On my right hand here is some library that I'm accessing, right? Here's my right hand, right? Let's say that has a constant in it called five, of a value of five, right? That value of five will be lifted up by the compiler and put into my code. Right. Right? If I change this value now to be 10, this code doesn't change. It still sees five, even though it's referencing this, this code over here, right? If I don't recompile, it doesn't see the change. Now, with read-only, what happens is the compiler takes the value, which hand is it? This hand. This hand. <laughs> I'm I feel like it. we're playing yeah. like a... Yeah, this is cool, right? The compiler takes the location of this value and puts that in my code. So when okay. I make a change over here, even if I don't recompile this code, it sees the change. Okay. Right? Interesting. This is very subtle. Difference. This catches people out. It's the same as things like um, classes and structs. What's the difference in a class and a struct? Right, they both now look it's the same. Right, stored in memory. Right, the difference is that a class is a what we call a reference type. Yeah. Right, and what a reference type means is when you assign a variable to a reference type, you effectively get. Again, we we kind of touched on this last week, the last time with Python. Right, it's not the memory address of the object, but it's yeah. a, a reference to the object. Right. Right. So two variables looking at the same type reference type, if the reference type changes, they both see the change. Right. If you a value type, which is a struct, is actually copied by value. So let me show you this inside here. So yeah, this is something um, that can get really confusing. This gets for people really are, this catches people out, right? This it is does. something you need to know, right? Yeah. So let me uh, create something here called a struct. So uh, let's define a struct. Uh, let's call it my struct, right? And I'm going to do everything in one line. And we're going to say public. Uh, a number. Oops, I need the type obviously because I'm in a structured lang type language. A number public string a string. I'm not very creative in my variable names, I know, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying right? anything. So var struct one equals new my struct, right? Yeah, we had a question from chat too. Uh, yep. Do they both refer, both to, the refer to the same address memory? I'm going to show you right now, Umar, right? There you go. That's what I thought. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give struct one's number a value of, let's say, five, okay? And S1's a string equals hello. Okay? There you go. Good so far. Let's see if I can echo this out. No, it doesn't do it that way. It gives me a type. Okay. Right. Let's do var S2 equals S1. But is S2 this, S1? I'm going to frame this comment for you. <laughs> Awesome. Look, well, Steve, let me, actually, let me expand on that as well as to why you would use a class versus a struct, right? Before struct, you do, I want to give yeah. your credentials. Uh, I have special credentials that I don't even think you maybe know about why you are the greatest person to be teaching C Sharp. I, I, I very much doubt that statement, but okay. <laughs> I believe you are because I went the other day and I saw on Twitter, you were the only person on Twitter that I know that mm -hmm. follows the Wix Twitter account. Oh. <laughs> which Wix is the Windows installer uh, yeah. software, right? And I I don't know anyone else who follows that Twitter account. So you, sir, to, to me, you're, you're the most qualified. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I would dispute that, but okay. All right, so we've assigned S2, a new, a new variable, right, to S1. Yeah. Strip two to strip one, right? If I do S2 a number, I see five, right? That's what I initialized it with, right? What's the value of S2 a number done? I got a number right now. I've just changed the value in S1. Yeah. To be 20. Right. 
Um, hmm. Answers in the comments. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you all think? What's what's the uh, what does S2 number say? I have two structs, right? I define a struct, right? In struct one, I put the number five. Right. In struct two, the, the point the reference to, to struct two, I put the value 20. Mm -hmm. It's still five because it's, it's by still value. Five. Because structs are value types, so they're copied, right? They're copied. Now, if we do the same thing with classes, you'll see the difference. So class, uh, what do I call it? My class. Joey, Again, I'll it. just do this in line, right? In number. Oh, I need an int, obviously. You'd think I've been working in dynamic languages recently, wouldn't you? This feels like one of those uh, interview questions that you'd get. Sometimes you do get this, right? Okay, so var c1 equals new my class, right? I have a class, I have a reference type now. Okay. c1 dot, again, we'll do the same thing, it's five, all right? var c2 equals c1. So now I have two class references. Right. Okay, c2 dot a number, print that out, it's five. Cool. Let's change c1's number to 20, all right? C2, C20 now. Yeah, because that's by Because it's a reference. reference type, right? So C1 and C2 are both looking at the same object instance, whereas struct1 and struct2 are looking at two different copies because they're value types, okay? If a struct is a value type, can you use by ref for a method parameter? Oh, that's a good question. I've never tried that. I'm going to make a note of that to try it later on. By ref, meaning uh, pass by reference, which is uh, yep. how you can pass in a parameter to a method, uh, either the value of what you're trying to pass into the, the method or the memory right. address, right? So am I am I basically, am I passing a copy or am right. I passing a reference to the original copy? And all of this goes down to basically how these things are stored in memory, right? Like it, it could either be... So when you were talking about const earlier too, uh, I had a question: Can mm -hmm. does C sharp const only support primitive types because it's uh, uplifting it in code, or can you have a const as a um, as a defined class, as a, right? As a type like string. Well, string is a class. Well, no, that's a prim. Oh yeah, yeah, I guess you're right. It's also a primitive. Um, but something like you, you know, our card. Could you set const? You know, Const C on the, equal on the to class? new car. Uh, I'm trying to think if it was a case where I might have done that. Uh, I don't know. And so, yes or no. I don't actually know. Again, I'd have to go and I'd have to go and play with that. Um, yeah, but all of it points to how things are stored in memory, which can right. be really confusing for a beginner of how variables, classes, all these things get yeah. passed around in memory. I'm trying to think. I've got a feeling like with const because I I remember from my I remember from my C and C plus plus days that depending on where you put the const, yeah. the reference was const or the object was const. Right. right? Um, right. And I, I don't know if that got inherited into into C sharp. Um, I'd have to go and play with that. I don't know. But Devin that's, says that's anything. I'm gonna go find out. Yeah. Um, and then uh, in in C, Just, right? Yeah. Not C sharp, obviously. C and C plus plus, for that matter. Um, you've got these things called pointers, right? Golang uses pointers as well. It's a little different than the pointers in C and C plus yeah. plus. But we're not using pointers necessarily. Uh, reference, pass by reference, and and pointer are not identical, right? We can't mm -hmm. call them the same thing, but they are similar, right? There are definitely things. Yeah. Now, Naveen has just put up an interesting comment, use string builder, which brings me to the next point, because we, we'll need to move on to project corner in a bit, but we're going to see some more C sharp anyway. Um, strings in C sharp are immutable. So yeah. what this means is that when I do something like um, string, uh, a string, uh, string equals, this is why I don't live code, <laughs> right? All right. That value is now fixed, right? Yes. If I was to do this, I now have two strings. Test is now going to be garbage collected at some point in the future, right? right? It's not referenced, but, but essentially the assignment of the value world 
returned a new string. You introduced the term there, Steve. And since we're still in beginner's corner, I have to call out garbage right. collected, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, C-sharp.net is a, is a, a managed environment, a managed runtime environment, right? So mm -hmm. when an object periodically, um, it runs what's called a garbage collector. And it's looking for values, objects, things that are, not, are no longer being referenced, right? right? And then it frees up that memory. Right. Right. So Which is how you get around memory leaks. In, in other languages that don't have the feature of garbage collection, uh, again, right. C is a good example right. of this, um, you actually have to manage the memory, memory yourself. yourself. Right? Yes. You allocate blocks of memory, and then you are also responsible for deallocating those blocks yes. of memory. Um, yeah. So C Sharp is like Java. Behind the scenes, there's a garbage collector that's watching memory load. Um, it either runs periodically or it runs when memory gets low. It'll look, it'll analyze all the objects in the in the code and go, yeah, this thing here is not referenced anymore. We can bin it and free that up for something else, right? There you go. Look at ah, printing a memory address. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah. So this, the reference to string build was basically if you're doing string concatenation in C sharp, then don't do this. So var a equals um, I'm going to I'm going to call these string one plus string two. Pretend these are just variables I've declared for string three, right? Because what happens is that as the compiler is running through this runtime, it's allocating multiple strings. Right. Each one is creating a new immutable string, right? What you would do is you'd create a string builder, right? And a string builder object has methods on it that let you append strings. Right. And then when you're finished with it, when you finish building the string, you just say, you call a method called to string on it, which sounds a bit weird, but to string and then that returns the immutable string into your variable. Is this That's, one uh, way of doing it. That's how we is, used to do it, right? Is this a a instance of what people refer to as lazy loading? Or not? Um, right? No, no. Okay. Lazy loading typically in C sharp means that you you've got some code in a library somewhere that you you dynamically load when you need it. Not okay. Um, but well, yeah, yeah, it doesn't read stuff into memory until you actually right, need it. Right. Well, that's why I thought maybe the, the strings were being handled that right. way as well. The new way in C sharp of doing that, right, is to say, is to use what's called string interpolation. Oh, yeah. Oh, so, uh, right. So string te a template uh, string equals, and you use, use a dollar and a quote to introduce that, right? So yeah. this is a, uh, and then we can use something like a C1 dot a number. Right. Right. Type out S now. So yeah, the value 20 has gone in there, right? Yes. That's typically how you do, you build strings now at runtime in C Sharp. You can use a string builder approach, which works still fine. It's in fact, for some cases that might be easier. Um, or you can do string interpolation. So string, is builder. string builder just like a list char-like structure? Uh, yes, that's tend to how I tend to think of it, yes. Um, and it has methods on for like removing bits, removing substrings, inserting substrings, appending strings, and so on. But it basically it's managing the underlying structure of all the characters. Right. And then when you finish building it, you call a two-string method, and it returns the string value, which is then immutable. But it's not doing uh, memory optimization or anything like that. No, it's not doing any memory optimization. Well, I you know, I've actually looked at the code. You know yeah. what? .NET now being open source, you could actually go and look at the implementation of a string builder and see exactly what it's doing under the covers. That's true. Um, and... Well, Steve, I got to give us a time check here too because I, I know, know we're in the project really corner, right? Yes. I this has been a really great beginner's corner, though. Uh, so I think for the next episode, what yeah. we should actually do is uh, perhaps in Python or C Sharp or TypeScript even. Yeah, we could do a We should language. build an object model. We should pick something. Okay. And we should define a model. Okay. Right? And then we could show how it's done in the different, how it, what it looks like in the two different languages, in different languages. Right. Should we keep it with the cards, you think? Playing cards? I don't know. What do you think? A sil classes, so uh, Divya, sil, a ah. sil class is one that you cannot derive from. You're getting some good, some good C sharp yeah. questions. Yeah, they're good, aren't they? Yeah. So yes, yeah, so if I say, uh, let's say, uh, public sealed, right? Then in C sharp, I can't do something like public. Can't inherit from it. Can't inherit from it. Public uh, class, other class. Can't do this, right? That would be illegal. Does that make sense? 
So that's how I can design a, a class that I don't want anybody to, to define an, a, 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 a class hierarchy from. Right. For a particular right. reason, right? There is another one that you can do. I'm going to, I'm going to mention it briefly before we move on because you, you threw it out there earlier on. Um, so right now inside my code, you see how I did this. Uh, I'm going to take, I'm just switch this out for a moment. New card, right? That creates a new card object, right? Right. So instantiates a, a, a card object. Oh, abstract. No, that's, okay. no, that's an error. An abstract class is a you, class you cannot instantiate. Now, yeah. now, the way you use this is, and the way I typically have used this is, uh, yeah, partial classes are good too. Uh, that's getting very advanced. Um, so if I have a, an object, a class hierarchy, right? But it doesn't make sense to instantiate, say, the root of a, the root of the hierarchy. So right. let's imagine that we have, uh, let's say, we're modeling pets, right? We have cats, we have dogs. Um, we need to stop at cats. And I'm fine. <laughs> we have fish, whatever, right? So cats and dogs are probably both um, members of, say, a mammal class. Yes. A mammal base class, right? All right. Fish would be, I don't know, a goldfish. Let's say we have a fish base class, right? But ultimately, they all come up to a class, a root class called pet. Okay. So right? everything is a pet. It doesn't make sense to say new pet. Mammals are a more specific type of well, pet. Well, uh, yeah, I, I was going to call them furry, but, you know. It, and then yeah. <laughs> dogs are a more specific type of mammals. Right. But they all, dog inherits from mammal. Yeah. And from pet. And from pet, right? But it doesn't make sense to say new pet, right? I want to say a new dog or a new cat right. or a new fish or a new goldfish, right? Whatever happens a bit, right? So in that case, I would mark the, the root of the class hierarchy as abstract to yeah. stop you newing it up, right? right? And I think Devin just asked some engineer, abstract is a contract for drive classes. That's right, right? I can actually guarantee that by putting shared functionality into that base class that abstract class that all my drive classes inherit it yes. automatically or i can declare an interface which we'll come to in a future code yeah, that's, we're going yeah. to get way down the rabbit hole here right? right where i can define common behaviors across classes that are not necessarily related by inheritance yes I had to, uh, we, we got a shout out from Joey too. Uh, extremely rewarding, Steve. You should feel that's good. some pride there. Um, so, there is more time and we're going to be talking about uh, more complex projects yeah. and some of this beginner stuff. Before we move from beginner's corner, could you recommend wow. any kind of free learning uh, resources for people just getting started with right. C Sharp? There you go. Your C Sharp type. C Sharp is getting started. Um, on yes. the learn.microsoft site. If you just search for C Sharp, it'll bring up a whole bunch of references, one of which is this programming guide, Getting Started, Fundamentals. Um, yeah. yeah, I remember partial classes back from the day when I used to work in the component object model. That's going back. <laughs> Before we jump to Project Corner, shall we do a, if you're just joining us? Do it just, if you're just joining us, yes. All right. If you're just joining us, I'm Amster. <laughs> this is... The Brit down here. And today is C-sharp day, not Rex Manning day, but it is, every day is Rex Manning day. Uh, and every day is Halloween too, Steve. But if you're just joining us, we are, that's how I live my life. We are talking all things coding. So uh, today being C-sharp day, we're learning mm -hmm. all about some intricacies of the C-sharp language. We've been covering coding fundamentals in general along the way. Differences between strongly typed languages, dynamic languages, why you'd use one, why you'd use the other, uh, because you are going to use both, by the way, uh, throughout your career. You will mm -hmm. use all, all kinds of different languages. One of my greatest pieces of advice to you all is um, continually be searching for something new to learn. And oftentimes that's a new language. Uh, mm -hmm. It will, the reason why we cover multiple languages on Code Corner One is because. You all are watching. You all want to see other languages. But also, it gives you a deeper understanding of programming to know the approaches uh, to these fundamentals of coding that other languages take, right? So it really helps right. to solidify some of your understanding of, of not just the philosophy, but even some of the implementation details of programming languages by learning different languages. So we're here. We're about to jump into our 
project corner. So not to leave out anyone. We also, we talk coding fundamentals and then we go implement some of them in a larger project for those who are, you know, further along in their learning journey. It's project corner time, Steve, project corner. Project corner, bank mask. All right. So last time out, you wrote a function called back mask, right? This is a Lambda function. It's going to run uh, only when we when we request it, right? It's yes. not going to run otherwise, so it's not costing us any money, right? But basically, we're going to give it some text. This is the Python version. Yeah. This is the Python version, right? This is what we came up with last time. Um, it's going to take that text. It's going to convert it to audio using Amazon Polly, one of our services, right? And then you write the code to reverse that audio using FFmpeg, right? Right. I hope all this is familiar to you, AM, because you wrote it. Right? Nope. Uh, <laughs> and, you then know it my... returns, and then you it know... returns the base 64 version as of that audio of that reversed audio as a string. Right. You know who yeah. my least favorite programmer in the world is, Steve? Me? <laughs> no. Me in the past. Uh, that's my that's my most hated developer because I'll go back and look okay. at code and be like, who wrote this? And then I'll do git blame. I'm like, I wrote this. <laughs> why? Why yes. did I do this? Yeah, well, I, I, there was a lot of why's as I converted this to C sharp, but anyway, th th we won't go there. But basically, that was that was the premise, right? We have a piece of text, we convert it to audio using a cloud service using Lambda to call Amazon Polly to, to, to cause to call Amazon Polly, right? We get the reverse, we then reverse the audio, we then in base64 encode it and then return it as a string as the as the logical output. Yes, we could put a web application around this, but right now we're just down at the fundamentals level, right? So we're just treating it like an API, right? So let's take a look at what this looks like in .NET. So here's the here's the Python version. So you know we have some we have some variables up here, right? I would call these constants, as we're about to see, right? We have some libraries and namespaces that you're using in the Python. And then we have the Lambda function that's going to be invoked when we hit the API, right? That's going to check the body, extract the text from the body, convert it to audio, and you have a bunch of functions that do all the work later on, all right? Just so everybody's on the, the same page. Well, at least I hope we are. So now let's get back to here's Rider, OK? so. Here we are inside Rider, and we have a C-sharp project, a .NET project. So I've included some package references so I, that I need for a Lambda function, including our SDK for Poly. All right. And I also found, by the way, a NuGet package for FFmpeg. So you knew, you know how you had the FFmpeg binaries and you had some Python wrappers as well? I did, yeah. Right? That's I found right. a C-sharp NuGet package or a .NET NuGet package that wraps FFmpeg, right? Which made life really easy, right? There you go. So that's kind of my project. And inside here is my Lambda function. So at the top, like we just saw, right, I have some using statements that are the namespaces that my code, uh, the namespace of, of classes that my code is going to call. We talked about namespaces earlier. We briefly mentioned namespaces, right, earlier on. Uh, there's our own namespace for this function called backmask, right? Yes. And inside there, I have a class called functions, imaginatively named, right? <laughs> but you'll notice that I converted your Python variables to constants inside my code. Oh, right? okay. Because I'm not going to change these. Right? right. So make them const straight away, right? I love that you kept my default voice, by the way. Yeah, I kept the default voice. Really point, appreciate right? that you kept Justin. The <laughs> and then I have a couple of properties inside here for the SDK's client to call Polly, all right? And I'm going to extract the logger, which I get handed to. My function gets received from Lambda when it runs. I get an instance to a logger, right? But I'm going to write some logs out. Inside here, I have a what we call a constructor. We didn't talk about constructors today, but typically classes can have constructors, right, yes. that initialize the object before it's returned, right? Right, so you might need to doing, do some setup. Right. There's, there's doing some setup, right? So inside here, what I'm doing is I'm registering some global options for FFmpeg to say oh, where wow. the temporary output folder is going to be, where this okay. code runs. And I'm instantiating a new SDK client from our SDK for .NET to call Amazon Polly. Okay. And I'm just assigning that into this property up here, with, which you'll notice is just a getter. Right. Because right. right. I'm initializing it in the constructor. I don't Are you going to talk at all? Um... Some of these packages, obviously, are not packages that you wrote or li libraries that you wrote. You're, you're pulling them in. You're going to talk at all about NuGet? 
Um, we will do later on. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, you'll notice that the logger, though, is getting set. Right? I could have made this private set. I was just actually, it is by default private set. Right? And the reason for that is I'm not initializing it in the constructor. I don't have it at this point in time. I only get it when the function runs. Right. So that's when I initialize the logger. Okay. Right? So this object here, the context, I take the logger out and I put it in this property because my methods later on are going to use it. Right. Right. Then I've got pretty much the same code that you've got, right? I do some defensive text to make sure, did you actually give me some content to, to change, yeah. to, to make audio, right? Um, unlike you, I get a voice. I allow a voice to be passed in on the request. As no, a you don't need to right? change the voice. <laughs> you yeah. like Justin. I like the, the voice. The voice is perfect. Okay. Um, I then extract the text from the body. I check that it doesn't exceed the maximum length that we set, right? We set a limit of 3,000 characters because we don't want to, be silly right and then i'm returning some error codes if you don't pass the validations right oh uh the uh the max characters were due to a more of a practical reason well if you remember, yeah right because we can't yeah. exceed that amount of characters yeah. when sending over to poly unless we send to poly asynchronously we're doing async, right yeah we're doing it synchronously so we can't that, right? when responding yeah. via the this is fronted by an API gateway, which expects a response in, I think, less than yeah. 30 seconds. But really, it should be immediate anyway. So yeah. like we could recode or, or, or uh, refactor this to use the asynchronous call to poly, mm -hmm. but it would take some more infrastructure changes. Yeah. Too. yeah. So I'm logging out some information on what I'm doing. And you'll notice I'm using string, string interpolation that I just showed you, right? right, to inject the voice and the text I'm going to change. Then I call a method on this class to back to convert it to audio. Okay. Right. And get back encoded audio, which I then return as the body. All right. And then down here is the code to actually do call poly using our SDK. Um, this is I the actual that. work that does the back mask, right? So I call poly to say, please encode this as audio. Okay. When I've got that, I reverse it. And then I return a base 64 version of it. Right. And here's the code to generate the audio files. This is calling Amazon poly using our yeah. SDK, right? A new upper request object that says, here's the text to convert. I want MP3 as the format and use this voice. All right. Now, uh, Steve, I don't want you to have to go too deep into this, but this might be a little confusing because we just talked about synchronous and asynchronous in terms of poly. And then you yes. see synthesized speech async. async. That yes. doesn't this... mean how poly returns no. a response. This is this is .NET's await async, async await pattern. Right. right. So what will happen is the call will go out to the service, which will do a synchronous job while it's working. The code here can get on with other stuff if need be, but it's going to wait that response to come back before it actually logically proceeds. Right. This is it, how you it's handle. Very deep. Yeah. You handle things like uh, input output with uh, yeah. asynchronous calls. You handle things like network, like I'm sending something over the network, which is what you were doing yeah. in the case of synthesis yes. speech. Yeah. So um, once I get, once I get that uh, that audio back, once the service comes back, I take the response and I put it into a file on the Lambda for a temporary file. Right. And here's my code hey, to this audio. There's another async. Uh, there's another call async. Right You'll find that all IO operations in .NET, in cross-platform .NET are async by default. Right. That's, That's input output right. that you're dealing with, not network in that right. case. Um, right, so then I actually use that FFmpeg wrapper to actually reverse the audio, all right? And then once I've done all that, I just base64 encode it, which is nice because that's built into .NET. All right. So let's deploy that, right? Um, I also, like you, I have a layer that says, hey, here's my FFmpeg binaries that need to be made available to Lambda, right? right? And then I have a CloudFormation template that actually has the function definition in it to deploy and an API, right? So we covered all of that in, in the last episode, in the infrastructure. So let's go ahead and deploy it. Right, so I need to find my terminal, which is here. And let's see, here's backmask. So here's the right folder. Let me clear up all this mess from earlier on. I was messing around with something. Where am I? Right, so I'm sitting in the root. So I'm going to do a SAM build. I'm using the service application model called CLI, command you line knew, tool, right? You knew where I was going, didn't you, Steve? Yeah, I knew exactly where you were going. Yeah. So I'm going to build that. All right, now I'm going to deploy it. And I'm going to deploy it with a particular set of credentials because uh, using default. And I'm going to deploy it to the US West 2 region, right? Because that's where I'm based. And we may as well turn on guided so we get the prompts, 
right. you're based inside the US, US West, West too. Yes. Uh, so let's give this a name. We'll call it Bat Mask, right? Region it's preset from my command line. Confirm change before deploy. Sure, why not? Right. Yes, it's going to need a role. It needs permissions to call poly, so it has to do that. Table rollback, apparently don't care. Authorization defined, yeah, that's fine because it's an anonymous API for the next 20 minutes. Save arguments to config file, sure, because I'm going to redeploy it. File and go. Okay, so now what it's doing is it's taking that SAM build output, it's packaging it up as a zip file, yes. and it's sending it off to CloudFormation to actually provision the infrastructure, right? Okay. So the Lambda function, the API that's going to front it, um, and so on. And when it's finished, we'll get back a, a URL to the to the API endpoint. Okay, this will take a few moments. Uh, there's a question from Umar for you, AM. Uh, yeah. Are the previous episodes available to rewatch? I'm looking at our YouTube channel. I don't believe our uh, our episode has been uploaded there yet. You can find the old episode and I'll link to the Twitch um, version of this. Uh, you can find the video on the LinkedIn page. Uh, however, I'll just send a link to the uh, actual Twitch one, which is a little easier to navigate to. And then everything is eventually, eventually consistent, I would say, uh, consistently uploaded to <laughs> YouTube. Uh, and so we have a YouTube channel with AWS. AWS events, but I'll send the Twitch link for everybody for the first episode of Code Corner. Okay, nearly there. So this is fully serverless, right? There's no resources are gonna be used until I actually call it. Right, there we go, we're done. So here's our API endpoint, right? Okay. The function, all right? So I'm gonna copy that. And then I have Postman open somewhere. So let's use Postman to actually Post a request. I'm going to put the URL. This is going to look really small on screen. I apologize. I don't know how to zoom this particular tool. Um, right, I'm going to change this to be a post because we said it had to be a post, right? And then I'm going to give it a body and let's we'll give it some text and say, hello. Hello, Amazon Polly. Please be so kind because you should always be nice to services. So kind. Yes. So kind. As to convert, of course, I should do a type. Convert this to or convert this to audio, so I can backmask it. Thank you, and that's nice and polite, right? Fingers crossed. Hit send. We should get back if everything's working. We should get back a base sixty four encoded um, chunk of text. There it is. There is the reversed audio, base64 encoded. So let's copy all of that. And my menu is way off screen. <laughs> <laughs> the benefit of multiple monitors, eh? Um, right, so over back here, I'm going to back into this window, and I'm going to jump into PowerShell for a little while because we're going to actually handle this text. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to capture that text in what's called a hair string. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but hair no. strings are multi-line strings. Um, in PowerShell. So okay. There's my variable, dollar encoded, and in the side there is all of that text that I just wedged in there. Okay. All right. Now the next thing I need to do is decode that audio. Right. Right. So I'm going to say, okay, so dollar decoded, and this is again beautiful. This is PowerShell, and I'm calling C sharp. I'm calling .NET classes directly from the command line. And from base64 string is a static method like I showed you earlier on in that code, right? So I can call it without mewing up a class. I'm going to pass in my value of encoded. Okay, so now that's decoded, that text. There's the, there's the bytes of the audio stream now, right? So now we're going to write that to a file. Oops, I'm going to take off casing because that won't work. Come on. System.io file. So that's the namespace and the type. Write all bytes. Right. Let's just call it reversed. .mp3, .mp3. And the value I want to output to the file is in the variable called decoded. But for some reason, I don't know why, this puts it at a higher level than where I actually am. So I'm going to move that file in here. Huh. Interesting. I don't know why. I haven't figured this out yet. But anyway, there we go. So now we have some audio. Now I'm going to put my volume up, and we're going to try and play this. Uh-oh. 
<laughs> Hopefully you'll you'll all hear this reversed MP3. Here we go. Hopefully you heard that. I don't know if you did or not. Um, <laughs> but it's backmast, right? Now we heard it. We heard it, Steve. Uh, <laughs> it's it's terrifying every time I hear it. I love it so much. All right. Now oh, there's something. <laughs> there's something else that I wanted to do, and that is, if we take a look at this function code here, right? You'll notice that this is C sharp, right? You had a lambda. You had a Python function. Let's take a look at your function. I did. Uh, did I close it? I don't know if I closed it or not. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing. I might have closed it. Probably did. You didn't did respect. I? You didn't respect my code at the beginning. Didn't respect your code. Yeah, it looks like I did. All right. You took mind. it and you uh, you changed it to the C sharp thing. Oh, there it is. Oh. There it is. Okay. So here was your your lambda function handler, right? He just said yeah. event context. You didn't care, right? No, and, and type, right? Well, and say, so, look, I'm doing some type, not even right. type checking. It's uh, property checking on the the object that's coming in through the lambda you, right. you can say no. <laughs> if not body i'm sorry i've just seen the number one no. issues comment <laughs> yeah that that uh this back right. masker really is uh, okay but what you'll see is in my code is i had to declare the types right so i've got mm -hmm. this let's call it boilerplate right that i'm going to take in a request object oops, a request a request object type right I have the Lambda context type, and then I have a response type. Well, this is all well and good, but uh, it's some overhead that, frankly, yeah. I'd rather not have to deal with. Right? Yours is a proper type, yeah. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to use what's called our new Lambda annotations framework, oh. right? And we're going to clean out some of this boilerplate. Okay. So what we have on NuGet, uh, where's my browser gone? Let's go into NuGet, NuGet.org. Okay, this is where all the .NET uh, packages that you can add to your, your code are stored, right? Distributed. We are talking about code. NuGet. Right? Here's I NuGet. thought we would. So this is our package manager for .NET, right? And we'll find this package called Amazon.Lambda.Annotations, right? And this is some code that turns this kind of boilerplate into this beautiful simplified function. Gorgeous. Right? Beautiful. So let's do it. That looks a lot like uh, if you're familiar with ASP.NET. It looks yes. a lot like an ASP.NET annotation. Yes. I mean, attribute-based coding is familiar to .NET Dev, so this this works out really nice. But even the REST yeah. API annotation, that was on accident, right? That it was the same? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to do Happy a accident. command called .NET app package. So I've got the .NET SDK installed. So I've got the CLI, right, the command line interface, right? And I'm going to add this Amazon. This is the first thing I'm going to do. So let's take this um, existing Lambda function and convert it and see how easy it is, right? Right. We're going to add the package. And so we saw this last time with pip, right, which is the Python. Right, you use the pip one, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to this back is up the same, here but more, for okay? .NET. So let's go back into Rider, OK? And let's start converting this function. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add an attribute, which we, we represent inside um, C sharp with square, square brackets yeah. called lambda function, right? Now this will complain a little bit because it's going to want a namespace, right? So let's do this up here already. So I'm going to add in using Amazon Amazon dot lambda annotations. Okay. All right. We got our lambda function declared. Now the other thing that I'm going to want is an API. Right? Yes. It's going to front this function with an API. So we're going to put HTTP API. Right? OK. So now I need another namespace declaration in here. So we're going to take this one and say using. Freaking me out a little bit that uh, Rider is not updating my uh, namespace here. <laughs> Thankfully, I kept notes. In fact, I even I even kept an actual branch. We could just switch the branch and not just have me code it out live. But you and me both are uh, over preparers for sure. <laughs> All right. So we've done that one. So now we know that the API function that we want is a is a post method, right? So there's a lambda 
Let me get the right one here. Actually, let me uh, build this for a second. Let's see if this, yeah, maybe this if trips you... the IntelliSense. Component does not contain. Oh, because I'm not in that folder. Oh, I know why. It's because I actually came into this from outside it. of Rider. Let me open. Yeah, you and you added that package into maybe yeah, it hasn't actually. Well, no, that's okay. Um, is that okay? But what's yeah? What the difference is is because I'm outside of the folder hierarchy. Okay. So let me quit from Rider for a minute. As you know, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm a VS Code. Yeah, let's do it. Like a guy. Well, I, I thought about showing VS Code, but we used that last time. We so. did. I, I love that you brought in Writer. JetBrains makes really great IDEs. Um, so we'll let that open. Boom, 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 boom. Okay. So here we are. This is better. Yeah, don't tell me that. I know about Git. Leave me alone. Okay, <laughs> so here we go. So now, now so I've got the red, I've got the red squiggles, right? So here are my methods, yes. right? So this is going to be a, a post method, okay? And what I want is the routing on this. If you remember on the API, it had that back mask. Yeah, I might want to put different functions behind different API paths, right? So right. there's my there's my path, right? Now, so Steve, now, would yeah. you say you've got the red squiggles? Is there a cure for that? What, what? Yeah, you you fix the compile error. Yeah, oh, that's right. So yeah, red squiggles in in most IDEs means uh, something's wrong in your code. Yes, for any of All our right. So now I'm going to change this. So instead of returning this explicit type, I'm going to use what's called the HTTP result, right? Because I want to return like 400s or 500s if things go wrong, right? Right. Um, and then I'm going to change the method signature. So instead of this grungy class that, um, let me get get rid of this. Get rid of this. Okay, so we know that we're going to take um, string, right? Which is we're going to call this voice override, right? Because I want to be able to change the voice, right? I don't know why. And I don't also get it. want don't understand string, this. which we're going to call text to back mask. Did right? you That's... get data on this feature request before we implement it? Uh, Did I get what? Did you get data on this feature request? Are there people asking to change the voice ID? Because I don't believe you that people want to change the voice ID. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. I, so, I don't think we should commit this time to building this feature request. Let's all right, see. we have 10 minutes, right? Let's do it. Okay. So we know that the voice override in my particular case is going to come from the query parameters. So right. I'm going to attribute and say, hey, this parameter comes from the query string, right? Yes. The annotations framework will take care of all the work of going to the parameter string getting that parameter and binding it to that variable, right? The text to back mask is going to come from the body, right? We saw that when I tested it, right? Correct. The other, so now this code here goes away, right? So you see how I'm checking, checking the body for text, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to replace that with what I've already pre-written because I'm lazy and we don't want to see this, right? So I'm going to do this and I'm going to, whoops. Hopefully, paste all the way down here and change all of this, right? Probably make a mess. There we go. Much simpler code, right? Did I get some text to back mask? If I didn't, throw a bad request. This hurts my soul. Take R. the voice. Justin, right? Justin's going away. If, if my back masking text is longer than I said I will allow, throw, a, throw an error, right? Nice. I like that. Save me some work. And then the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the response here of the overall function, right? If you remember, we had this grungy bit here where we have to return up a proxy response. Let's get rid of that and just say, return HTTP results okay with the encoded audio. Boom, nice, all right? Go. And for the error one, I'm just going to return a HTTP insert internal server error because something went wrong in my function on my side. It wasn't due to code that, uh, you know, you gave me, right? So we'll just say, Something went wrong. Something went wrong. I think we're going to run over a little bit on our show time today. That's okay. I don't think anybody's uh, next. All right. So I have a red squiggle down here that I need to fix. What's my action list here? Uh, oh, yeah, void. No, no, I want high HTTP result. That's definitely what I want. Leave me alone. Okay. So... Let's see if this builds. I love how you talk to your IDE the same I, way I that do, you talk I do to me. IDs. Oops. But no, you talk to it in the same tone of voice and, and using the same it words as when you talk to Oh, I know what it is. To me, returns. Steve. Not all code paths return. Okay, try, return, okay, catch. Oh, I forgot the return. That's why. Ah. There we go. There, you there go. we go. 
All right. I don't want to paste. If you, All right, uh, it builds. All right, well, that's okay. But there's still a little bit of grunge in here. Let me get rid of this is window. Is there? There's still a little bit of grunge in here. You'll notice that I took from the Lambda context this logger. Yeah, look, there's Eddie Vedder right, right there. Well, I don't want that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use that new Power Tools library I showed you at the start. Steve I'm going to put that in. Right? <laughs> yeah. She's so, ignoring my foolishness. I, just I am ignoring your foolishness, uh, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to add another package. This is that Power Tools package that I showed you earlier on. Dot, uh, lambda dot power tools. I think this is the right syntax for it. Logging. Fingers crossed. All right. We now have that package installed. All right. So let's go back to Rider. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use another attribute. I'm going to say logging. Oh, yeah. We're gonna add uh, once I get this right. Let's put this on. Import that. Import yeah, that you got to pull in the power tool, right? Okay. I'm still gonna keep this, the lambda context, because that's where the log is coming from. Okay. But I don't need this anymore. I'm gonna get rid of this. Whoops. I'm gonna get rid of this. Nice. And I'm also gonna get rid of the storage of that property. Right. Because okay. the power tools instance. Power tools will do that for me. Yeah. All right. Hey, she builds. That's good. Let's see if it deploys. Moment of truth. All right. So I'm going to CD back to where the template is. Oh, actually, there's one other thing I wanted to show you was yes. I need to make a change to the template. So template.json. So when that code built, what it did, it updated my template. You'll notice, well, you may not have seen this, but um, the actually application to backmask. Let me pull this off into a, another window over here. Oh, Let's yeah. Go. Hang on now. Template.json. Yeah, is, one second. Uh, Let me open this as a new window. Uh -huh. ah, go away. What it did, it put it into my existing uh, version of code, which is not what I want. So let me get rid of this. Control Z, Control C. Right. Let's see what we're doing here, right? What folder am I in? I'm in here. All right. Because I do need to make some changes to this. Okay. So let's open this up in Rider. We're definitely going to overrun today. That's okay. That's good, right? We haven't got anything else to do. We're all good. Oh, I've got lots of other stuff to do, Steve, but I'd much rather be here talking with you <laughs> and talking with our wonderful audience. Uh, I it was my rider. Okay. Open the directory. Just open the directory. Put it I'm glad we spent extra time in Beginner's Corner. We, we were having yeah, a lot of that really was good. great conversations. So you'll notice that, well, maybe you won't notice, but here was my original backmask function that was la the Lambda function declared, right? right? But what the tooling has done, it's actually created another version of it, the generated version. So at oh. build time, we're using the new C-sharp um, code generators at co compile time to emit this change, right? So what this is saying is, okay, you actually have a function inside here. The handler is generated for me. I don't have to maintain this anymore. Before oh, nice. I have to go in my code, I would have had to, if I changed my function name, I'd have had to have gone in here and change this handler to point to it. Not anymore. With the new annotations framework, that's all taken care of for me. All I have to do right now is just take over a couple of these statements. And I could have done this in the code as well. I don't yeah. need to do it here, right? I'm going to take into here the role that I'm going to need, right? Come back. There we go. Ah. That paste this, okay. I don't know why that's all highlight. <laughs> no idea why that's all highlight right now. Um, and the other thing that I need is we're using a lambda layer that's holding the FFmpeg binaries, right? So I need to basically right. reference that. So here's my layer designation here. Right? Why did it do that? That's a weird thing to do. Let me close that off. You've got code writing code. Yeah, what's here. it? Why? Where? Why is it gone yellow? What did uh, it that do? That one I don't know. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, no one can horrible. help you there, Steve. It's horrible. No one can help me. No one can help me. All right. So I'm going to take this layers thing down here. You know who could help you? Who could help me? Justin. But you you, no, uh, I got, you got rid, of, rid Justin. of Justin, so you're on so your own. To code URI here. I'm just going to bolt in that. Um, I'm going to take these two out because I don't need them. They're in globals. Okay. So that's the Lambda function that was generated. The, the definition was generated, updated, right? Everything else is the same. Now, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to take out this particular. I think it's because I hit Command and Shift K because I'm switching between VS Code and uh, 
Oh, yeah. Rider. So Rider's using the Visual Studio key bindings. Right. Um, okay, so now I have my layer definition. I have my function definition. We're all good. Apart from I want one more thing, which is some environment variables for that logging setup. Okay. So I'm just going to paste these in at the top where I have all my globals here. And we'll see why I'm going to use these in a minute. All right. So hopefully relate to Lambda. Okay. So let's see what happens. Oh, you can tell I've only recently switched to a Mac, right? My fingers aren't like. <laughs> you don't have the muscle memory. Yet. I don't have the muscle memory. Yeah. So let's do a sand build and make sure it builds. Oh, hang on. Where am I? No, I don't want to be there. Oh, I've, I've gone up one too high. There we go. Sand build. I have to be in the folder where the template is, right? We'll build that. What can I say? I'm incompetent. <laughs> no, I'm laughing at the comment from Richard. Justin What's is that? doing the highlighting, highlighting in protest. protest. Yes, yes, he I would. agree. All right, I, so cool. I telepathically made that happen. It, it builds. We got that going for us. So let's do the deployment again. All right. Rebe that would be more telekinesis, actually. Yeah. I mean, I saved these, but yeah, you know, we, we can just run it now. Let's see if it'll run without being guided. Do do do. Okay, building, sending. Waiting for change set. Waiting for the change set. So this is if you're not if you're not seen this before, this is CloudFormation looking at what you sent versus what it has to define. Here's the change set of things I need to change, right? And we'll notice straight away. Deleted. Notice how we now have a new function and a new role. This is the generated wrappers, the That's generated right. code in the template versus what I had before, which will clean up. So I'll take that away. Some code That's writing code. Code, code, code writing, writing code. code. And let's face it, the best code you write, the best code you ever run is the code you don't have to write. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, that's very true, unless, unless it's not very good code. Uh, unless it's not very good code. <laughs> and we may be about to find that out. Yeah. Who knows? But no, the, the code that's being generated here is very good code. Uh, and I know that because uh, it was created by Norm, right? Yeah. Yeah, which go norm. Back to the so let's go back and consider norm. what we did, right, while we wait for that to, to go away, right? So we changed this. So instead of taking those horrible types, right, we take the logical thing that we want the function to run on, the query right. parameter and the body text I want to convert. Right. I don't have to take these out of an object type somewhere, right? No. Um, by adding the power tools, I can add logging into my code. I don't have to do any explicit um, storage of the logger object from the context. Yeah, right? that's going to be handled for me. And what you'll notice is I'm still emitting here the text, right? Just un just unstructured text. Right. Right. But when we go and look at CloudWatch logs later on, you'll see how that's been converted to a structured statement, the structured logging statement. The Lambda annotations requires cloud formation. I think I read somewhere that the Lambda function requires. Uh, I don't know if it does require. I hadn't read that. It does update the the template, which is cloud formation based. So yes, I suspect it probably does. You can't do, I haven't yet tried using our .NET Lambda tools to actually deploy an annotations version mm. of a serverless application without a template. Um, but that's probably something to go try. To investigate there, yeah. Something to uh, investigate. Can you make, right. I, I wanted to ask real quick, Steve, can you make those parameters coming in optional? Like if you yeah. don't know if you're going to get a voice ID. Uh, yes, it is optional. It did, is. Did I, not, did I not show you that? I don't know. I don't remember. You may have, and maybe I missed it, which that's very possible. <laughs> Here it is. You see this voice ID equals oh, voice I see. Like double, okay. double query. That yeah. means if voice override is null or empty, use the okay. default voice constant. Right? So you don't actually have to set it as optional in the parameter list no. just when you're no. trying to use the... So parameter. let's go back to Postman. All right. Uh, let's do... Please be so kind to uh, as to uh, one, work. <laughs> and... Two, right. We'll just extend this a little bit, right? Just for some text, right? Now you have to so, change the voice ID. And too, now right? I'm going to change the voice, right? So I think I call that voice override. And let's take uh, Gwyneth from Wales. Lovely. All right. Okay. Send Bye, that. Justin. Fingers crossed. Bye, Justin. You will be missed. By me only, I, I assume. Okay. We have some encoded audio. Woo! All right. So we will take that. 
and my menu is off screen again. <laughs> oh. the, be the, the perils of a 34 inch wide monitor. It's like, it's way over here. <laughs> I would love if we could get uh, Megan's voice from the movie Megan. Uh, mm. I don't know if you're familiar with Megan. No, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar with half the stuff that you come up with. True. Megan's great. That would oh, be a great voice. These have. separate. So encoded two equals another here string, right? I'm going to post all that new text in and it looks longer. I'm sure that's not my imagination. All right. We'll find out. <laughs> decoded to equals. Let's decode it. Convert. Tap, tap. I'm also slow typing today because I got an ouchie last night. I was laying laminate floor and I actually ouchied myself. So. Oh, no. I'm, 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 I'm partially crippled today. Um, I just realized our, our banner would cover the tech. <laughs> so I... It's trying to put up a banner, but I'll do it. What with my ouchie? No. Oh, <laughs> welcoming people to the stream, sending ah. them to the GitHub repo where all of this is stored. So let's call this uh, reversed two. All right, MP3. So we have two files, and it's going to be dollar decoded, decoded do. And I have to move it down because I don't know why it puts it in the top folder. But anyway, to help. Move it to there. Okay, you ready? I'm ready. First, give me two. Thank you. All right, here we go. Turn the volume up. No. You probably didn't get the, the additions to the text, but you should have heard that was a different voice. It was. That was not Justin. <laughs> right. What did you just summon, Steve? Uh, uh, I don't know. But what I wanted to show you now to finish up that demo was uh, we're going to go and look into the uh, CloudWatch console, right? Richard is... Question uh... while I do, this. do you know if the cool looking portals... All of that was .NET Core. So Lambda only runs .NET Core, Richard. So it has right. to be... Uh, I don't think... I think .NET 3.1 is .NET Core 3.1 is out of support now, but it, you can use .NET 5. .NET 6 obviously is the latest managed runtime. You could also use .NET 7 uh, if you want, but then you have to write, build your own custom container image to run it because it's your not own a runtime. Runtime support version. All right? right. So, what do you mean I'm running out of time? No, I said your own runtime. Oh, your own runtime. Yeah. In, in all right. So here's CloudWatch. Let's go into CloudWatch logs. All right. So this is the original function that we ran first thing. Here's the log stream, right? And you'll notice that in the log, here is, that was the message that I sent. Remember, Amazon Polly, please be so kind. Oh, notice yeah. That's just the string, right. right? Let's go back to the log groups and look at the generated one where I use the power tools. Power tools. Right? In the power tools now, notice how these are now all structured logs. Oh, wow. I didn't change my messages, but I got yeah. structured logs out of it. So now I could go to the login sites. I can do run SQL queries or SQL like queries against those logs to pull out various bits of information, right? I so that's where that, that Power Tools library is really, really cool. And it yeah. also does metrics and also uh, X-Ray if you want to do tracing of the calls, which I didn't do today, obviously, but right. uh, you can also do that. It's a really simple annotated version that you add. So you've got the Lambda Annotations Framework for converting that grungy Lambda function um, signature yes. to something more readable, more understandable, especially if you're coming from a dynamic types. And then you have the power tools to get like structured logging metrics and other things out. And so if you're not using .NET, you're using other languages, there there are the power there tools. Other, that, there are other ones, yeah. Other languages like Python, which we used last yeah. episode. So if you want to take a look at the code today, if you're a .NET dev, you want to take a look. If yes. you go to our Code Corner Projects repo or well, AMs, Code Corner Project Repo. You almost said Alan Michael. I nearly said Alan Michael, yeah. Who is that? that? If I call you Alan Michael, you're in serious trouble. I'm in trouble. Um, if you go down to the projects folder, there's an S1E2, Series 1, Episode 2, backmass.net. And that's where you'll find the original code uh, that's in there that you can run. And there's also a branch that has the annotations version. It's, it's only using the Lambda Annotations Framework. It's not using the Power Tools because I wrote this before the Power Tools were released. I only need any power tools in this morning, um, but you could then take that and, and play with it and use the, the power tools to add SDK, uh, sorry, X-ray tracing and other things. So a whole lot of fun you can have 
with that uh, summoning. I don't know what with those messages. <laughs> <laughs> but that's C sharp and lambda, right? There you go. Easy. Easy. I love it. I love it. What an episode. That was just that chocolate. was jam packed, right? Full of uh, really useful stuff. That's that's pretty amazing. So, Steve, shall we wrap things up? I think we should wrap it up because we are just over time. Yes. Yeah. You, you brought it in uh, just just not too far over. Um, so, let's but it was that. amazing before the before we started this one. I was like, "How are we going to fill two hours?" I know you kept telling me, "Oh, we're going to do ninety minutes, ninety minutes." I was like, "Okay, <laughs> sure, yeah, ninety minutes, yeah." Uh, but look, Steve, we got great comments from everybody we watching too. They were. Very appreciative for the time. So I, I think uh, it's it's time well used, uh, at least from yep. my perspective. And hopefully yep. for those of you watching from your perspective too. And I hope you got from that as well. I mean, there was, was a little bit of fumbling around in the editing with Ryder, right. but I hope you got from that how easy it is to go from an existing Lambda function, if you've got one written in .NET, right? right to the new annotations version, right? You just add that attribute for Lambda function. You add the HTTP API attribute to say where you want it to be posted yes. you update your template to remove your existing function definition in the template and put in adopt the generated one right which right. just means moving over some permissions and other bits you may have used in my case there was a permission and the lambda layer i was using with the ffmpeg binaries but other than that that's all i did i didn't yeah. substantially change my code right and maybe some of those who are asking us earlier on in the in the episode you know why c sharp you know, why are you so showing C sharp mm -hmm. today? Maybe they have a better answer to that question now. Uh, maybe they, you know, stuck with us and saw and, and are excited to maybe go try out some C yeah, sharp. Go try it. And if not, that's okay too, because we'll cover other languages. Please yep. tell us what languages you all would like to see. We've, mm -hmm. we've covered Python so far. Uh, C sharp was today, you know, TypeScript in the future, Golang, more C sharp, more Python. Whatever you all want to see, uh, please let us know. We saw a bunch of people asking for Rust earlier. So uh, that's got gotta, Rust. <laughs> gotta go on the list, I think, Steve. Um, yeah. But yeah, we will uh, be back with more Code Corner in just a few short weeks. If you are curious when we air, we have a schedule on our Twitch page. That's twitch.tv slash AWS that has a list of all of our programs, right? So AWS on air. Uh, has a bunch of different programs available. We do a Friday show every week where we talk about new launches and new features from AWS. We've got the startup show uh, with Jillian Ford. We've got uh, security lockdown, uh, which we've got a question that would be a really great question for the, the lockdown show. So you should, Divya, you should go check out yep. the lockdown show and ask this question. This is way too deep yes. a question uh, for the time we've got left today, but we're happy to talk about it too. But definitely mm -hmm. go talk to uh, the lockdown team when whenever they have their show going. We've got the game day show. Step up your game day. I'm the dev advocate for game day, so I got to talk mm -hmm. about game day. You know I do. And Steve and I, throughout the year, uh, I think we'll be building a game day uh, mm -hmm. uh, for .NET, actually, right? Yeah, ho well, hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, and and you might you know be able to go play that game at some of uh, the upcoming events mm -hmm. that we've got as well. So we'll keep you updated on that. Maybe we'll even talk about what we're building and how we're building on Code Corner too. That could be kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, all right. So but next episode, I think we should commit at this point to building a class hierarchy for something. Yeah, that, that right. could be a good thing for uh, for the beginner's corner. Um, project beginner's corner. corner will be a class hierarchy of something. I don't know. What should we what should we work in? TypeScript? I, I'm feeling TypeScript, but if, if okay. there's uh, some uh, you know, let us know, right? And you can you could reach either of us on on mm -hmm. Twitter as well or LinkedIn. Uh, you know, please feel free to message us uh, if you want to see something specific on the show. Or uh, drop an issue in our GitHub repo. Oh, even better. Yeah, please, yeah. please, please yeah. go check out the Git repo. Um, yeah. Start if you feel like it, uh, whatever you want, right? But yeah, we've got uh, this Git repo to work with you all in here too. Uh, all the projects that we'll be building throughout this series will go in this repo. And yeah. um, speaking of, I, I know we mentioned last time that we would work on 
adding new features to the back masking service, which we'll spend maybe a little bit of the project corner doing next time. But I really want to get to another project too. So uh, we'll definitely be building something new in, in next episode's project corner. Um, you'll just have to come He just doesn't know. He just, I'll, I'll, uh, complete transparency, he just doesn't know what yet. Oh, really? I, I've got some ideas, but I, I want to keep it a secret, a mystery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah, will come that. watch. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, we should thank everybody too. Steve. Yes. Yep. So thank you all for sticking with us this whole time mm -hmm. uh, and watching this whole time. I hope that was fun. Yeah, we're getting uh, some Java requests now, which I think yeah. is only fair since we spent a whole episode on C Sharp, right? Yeah. To, to cover Java as well. So that'll be tricky because I've never written a line in Java in my life. But anyway, I've written some, but uh, not a lot. Uh, so we'll see. But yeah, uh, please let us know what you'd like to see in the future. Please let us know, uh, you know, what we can, we can build that will help you. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, come watch us next week or not next week, next episode, which should be in two weeks. Two weeks. Believe. Same time, Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific. Yep. Uh, and for older episodes, I, I sent earlier the, the link to our Twitch uh, channel. We, we also have these up on YouTube as well as they come out, but that takes a little bit more time than the Twitch side. On Twitch, they're available almost immediately afterwards. Uh, so yeah, go watch episode one. Anything you want to leave the audience with, Steve? Go try C-Shop. Yeah, go try C sharp and some of our tools. And and take that uh, if you are a beginner program, if you're if you're just getting into coding, you know, and you are looking at uh, strongly typed languages that have things like classes and class hierarchy, go and find something in the house and model it as a class hierarchy. I'm not giving you homework, yeah. right? But go do that because you'll find it quite informative. And so when you start thinking through, like we were earlier on, like where where certain things would fit in a class hierarchy, right? Yeah. Does it make sense to instantiate classes higher in the hierarchy than maybe the leaf classes in the hierarchy and so on, right? Go go figure that out. Go go experiment. Model don't some plants. Overboard, obviously, don't model every piece of furniture in the house or whatever it is that you, you no, model. plants. Yeah, model some, some a few bits. Try it out. Model it's some it's plants. a really good learning experience. Right? Like uh, you can model a uh, cactus, get some a succulus, a succulents base class. Right? Plants, uh, pets, furniture, games, right? Pick a favorite game and, and see if you can model it in, in a class hierarchy. Model yourself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Richard loved it. <laughs> And he'll be back. So hopefully you like. all will be too. And look, we, I, we haven't seen this yet. Ruby. If you want some Ruby. Hmm. It's been a while since I've looked at Ruby. No Ruby. I know we have a Ruby SDK. Yeah, I've but... done some Ruby in the past. Hmm. Mostly Rails. Okay. Back in the day, Ruby on Rails. Um, but yeah, that would be cool. Uh, Ruby was a really nice language. Hmm. Very uh, kind of similar-ish to Python, um, I'd say. Closely right. related to that. Anyway, we got to wrap up. We got to go. Yeah. But thank you all for watching. We will be back for another episode of Code Corner. Two weeks. See you then. <laughs> Bye. Bye.